lucky enough to see the nuclear assault sound check, this is all we did. <laughs> What's happening? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, episode 317. If you know what I mean, can you dig it? How's everybody doing on this wonderful Sunday? Could be could be afternoon, could be evening if you're over in Europe. Uh, what's up, Chris Spikey? Good to see you. Um, is that right, John? You saw Sub-Zero the other night. Yeah, I saw that they were over there doing their thing. Yeah. Rob King, London calling. Yes, here we go. Nuclear assault, and we will be talking about that today. Yeah. Hey, there he is. Hazer, what's happening? Good, good. Good to see everybody. Debo, yo, big shout out today. Uh, Lee from New York Hardcore Comics. It's his birthday. Big, big supporter of this show. And Debo to pro, as you know, fan favorites here on the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. So. Happy birthday, Lee. I love you, and, and thanks. You guys You guys are the first that came on board to support this show, so I really appreciate that. Is that right, Larry Kelly? It's going to be a great show. Howie is coming through today, too. Yes. Yes, sir. That, that, that is true. You know what? It, you know what? As, uh, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, where's my Howie Abrams interview? My, my Howie Abrams intro i'm bringing you on howie please welcome back to the show an author and former a and r man with a rich history in the thrash metal and hardcore game through the years he's worked with many artists including 24 7 spies sick of it all hr and many many others very excited to have him back on the show co-hosting with me today my neighbor and our friend mr howie abrams Yay! Hey, man. Coming in now, batting. <laughs> I thought it was—I thought it was a bullpen, uh, a, a relief pitcher. 
Derek Jeter. Jeter. <laughs> no, wrong team for me, my friend. I know. You're a Met fan. I am a Met guy. Were you always a Met fan growing up? Yeah, grew up in Queens, man. I was like no more than 15 minutes away from Shea. Right. Um, you know, it's funny because my parents were those like uh, those Brooklyn Dodger fans you hear about, you know, sure, sure. that were just, sure. you know, so bummed when they left. And so my father never really became a Met fan. He like hate watched the Yankees, you know, right. um, because he was so familiar and they would always play the Dodgers and beat them. And my mother became a big Met fan. You know, the, the early on, the Mets were, you know, they had Casey Stengel and they sort of had, you know, they, uh, <coughs> they, 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 they tried early on, you know. It was, path it was pathetic. And a little bit before my time, as far yeah. as like when they were just, you know, like, like legendarily horrible, you know. You know, I'm, I'm basically a New York sports fan. And I must say, 1986 was very exciting when the Mets when the Mets won it, it was, that was incredibly exciting. Yeah. There's something to not expecting it, you know, like mm -hmm. not that yeah. they didn't, they, they went into the season expecting to be great. They really did yeah. um, to the point where there were moments when they were coasting, you know, and they were just sort of like, you know, doing drugs and doing all the stuff they were doing, you know, and like to the point where they're like, well, we're supposed to win, you know? And then you read those stories where like, the Sunday day games where they were like, yeah, we weren't like technically awake until the sixth inning. Right. They're like, so if we could hold it together for like six innings, then we could sort of win the game. But like we weren't functional. <laughs> well, that was that was the year they won. And like Dwight Gooden didn't make it to the parade because he was like smoking crack in the projects or something. Right? Well, he was like stuck in someone's apartment. No one yeah. woke him, you know, and yeah. I think uh, like, Keith almost didn't make it also. There were other people who almost didn't make it where they, they had to climb over barricades at the parade, like the cops, like recognize them and how to let them, you know, sort of into the parade. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I remember that parade. It was, it, it was exciting. That before we move on, that was, that was exciting. And when the Rangers won the Stanley cup, that was exciting. Also incredibly 94 was incredible. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's just, again, it's funny, like the Rangers didn't feel like underdogs when they won it in a weird way, other than the yeah. like Messier calling the game six or whatever. Um, but the, the, I like when the Mets are underdogs, which thank God in a way this year they are again, yeah. when they're favored or anything, it's a nightmare because they never live up to the expectation. So, you know, two years ago, they win a billion games and then just crap out in the wild card, you know? Paris Mayhew's calling us out. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Iron Maiden. That'll perk him up. Yeah. That said, uh, let's bring on Stephen Messina. Oh, there he goes. Speaking of Long Island, here he is. <laughs> What's happening? Yeah. Come on, you hockey puck. What's happening, you big I, hockey I come puck? from a family of Islanders and Yankees. What's I'm happening? sorry. That yes. said, let's do photo. <laughs> let's do photo of the day. Let's, um, do it. let's have some fun with it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Wrong answers only. Photo of the day. There you go. Wrong uh, answers. Yeah. Wrong answers only, please. There you go. Um, the psychos. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. What do we got? Come on. Wrong is this, answers. Is this last night? This is. All right. Come on. Is it Black Flag? It is not. Well, kind, well, no, there's one dude that was in Black Flag. Well, sure, sure. That's right? True. But it's, yeah. Yep. Is it yes, Drew, Drew Carey and the Whalers? Is it Drew Carey and the Whalers? Good one. <laughs> is it the Proclaimers? Good one. Good one. Yep. Is it? Come on. Boy, there you go. The ascendance, yes. Is it the ascendance? Is it man of war? Is it Devo? Kind of. <laughs> man of war. Is it the proclaimers? What was the proclaimers? They were like they had like that one like they were like a soundtrack song or something. I would walk five hundred miles. Remember that song? That that's the proclaimers. Yeah. Ba -da 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 -da. It sounds like um like midnight oil. It's similar. Two guys. Man, with I hated that shit. 
<laughs> I hate shit like that. All right. Um, here's another shot. Let's see. Let's see what else we got. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, okay, yeah. This is the guy. The Jenna torturers. <laughs> uh, this is the guy that plays drums. Here's a hint. Big dude, big boy playing drums right there. <laughs> Yep. It's got caveman face going. Is all it the bear. Group of the three motherfuckers? Is it all? Kind of. Close. Hey, Rob Granger. Kind of all. All right, what is it, Steven? Well, that, the man you're looking at is Bill Stevenson, of course. And uh, this was last night at the, um, <clears throat> the Brooklyn Paramount, which is the first time I've ever been there. And it was the last night of the Descendants Circle Jerks Adolescence Tour. Oh, it was the last night of the tour. Last night of the tour. It was it was a fantastic show. And uh, first time I got to see the Adolescents, who I've never seen. And uh, and then uh, Circle what's, Jerks. What's the, what's the look here? Is this Milo? <laughs> is, is this Milo? What, what, what's he got? His water bottle? Is that like the... His, his water stage? bottle is on like a glittering... Uh, <laughs> Like a Chewbacca Bandolero thing there. Okay. Very strange. <laughs> yeah. He looks like he's the stage manager for the other two bands. Yeah, right. You know what? I I heard they were I heard they were great. They were great. And and a crowd always, were nuts for them too. Good. I heard that and then this band was on the bill too, who you know, whatever, right? Yeah, the adolescents. Yeah. They looking not so adolescent. <laughs> not even yeah. close. Yeah. But still a thick head of gray hair that guy has, huh? That's um yeah. that's uh what's his name? Um that's Kadina, right? That's um who the fuck sings for the adolescents? I forgot. Let me see who else. What else? Oh, here's a Milo shot you sent me. Who sings for the adolescents? I forgot. I it's, can't isn't remember. it? I'm drawing a blank. Singer for the adolescents. Uh, yeah, there's Latin. Milo. <laughs> yep. I, he does have a little Drew Carey going on there. He really does. The glasses. <laughs> yeah, Tony. Thank you, Tony. You know, you know what I always sort of like being a glass. Being that I wear glasses, I I never could sort of connect with guys in sort of aggressive bands, front men, singers that play with their glasses on, you know, <laughs> it's, it's strange, like, that, right? like, like to me, it's like you're about to get into a fight. You should yeah. be wearing your glasses, you know, and that's yeah, why I wear, that's why I wear my contact lenses, you know, when I go out in case I, you know, in case shit should <laughs> jump off. <laughs> I guess that's part of his look though. You know I mean? Uh, Maybe just something like contact lenses. Oh, and then these guys, speaking of looks, right? Speaking of looks that might have might have <laughs> expired on the shelf life, right? These <laughs> this, this guy. No. Yeah, they, they but they look kind of cool. You yeah. know what? I'm yeah. I'm such a Hudson fan. I mean, you know, from bad religion days and Red Cross and you know. He's a big part of the history, you know. And in fact, uh, Hudson. Uh, and speaking of not wearing your glasses on stage, <laughs> yeah. I, and he looks blind. He looks like uh, knowing knowing Greg Hudson, which I do a little bit. He's probably playing on stage, just taking his glasses off. He's probably literally blind on stage. <laughs> <laughs> it's very possible. You know, the yeah. thing I noticed about him last night is the first time I've ever seen him play where he didn't jump once. Yeah. And he was always a jumper. He was always all over the stage. And uh, maybe, maybe his knees are bothering him or something, but, uh, but he was really good. In fact, um, Keith Morris was describing all the bands that all the guys in the band have been in. Well, you know, I've been in all these bands and, you know, <laughs> let me tell you something. <laughs> Jesus. He, Listen, you know what? That was the deal breaker for me last night. Because like I could have went. I could have went. I could have walked right in. But then I thought, man, I cannot be standing there at midnight 
hearing one of his long-winded, like, you know, the last time, I'm like, I just can't do it, man. Uh, so I'm going to see Doyle tonight in Jersey. <laughs> Instead, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the, the cool thing was the show was supposed to have a, a hard 11 curfew. And because it was the last night of the tour, the Descendants ended up doing like almost a half hour encore. Well, they paid for it for sure. You know? Yeah. They, uh, <laughs> it was it was really a lot of fun. Tons of people. So many people there I didn't even see until I saw that they were there today. You know, but uh, great. You know, uh, do, you know the, do you know any of the history of that of that new venue? I don't actually. That history was the, it was the Paramount Theater, right? Yes. Yes. That 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 Barbara Streisand was a um, was a um, what do you call it? Um, usher. An an usher, usher there, and also that's where the Alan Freed famous rock and roll riots took place at the in the end. At, I think in the fifties, those famous rock and roll riots was at the Paramount Theater. That was at in that venue. Yeah. yeah. And that's sim cool. similar to the Paramount, you had the King's Theater, right, which okay. was yeah. refurbished, but. The King's Theater was right down the block from Erasmus High School in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. where right. Streisand went. Right. Um, my mother-in-law went to high school with Barbara Streisand. They're in the right same on. yearbook and everything. And I was like, so, and she said, we used to go to the King's Theater, like after school. I was like, what, to see movies? She's like, yeah. I was like, that place holds like 4,000 people. Wow. And she's imagine? like, yeah, but like, that's what it was like, like people, yeah. the whole school would go over and go to the movies yeah. afterward. Like radio, afterward. like Radio City Music Hall, right? right. Like something yeah. of that magnet. Radio City Music Hall used to have movies. Right. You know? I and mean, they're massive theaters. Massive. Oh, King, that's King's Theater, they did an incredible job refurbishing. It's beautiful. Incredible. I think the, I think the city was involved in that. And I, I think... It really, it really sits empty most of the time. Like yeah. they, they don't have a lot of events in there. Yeah, they do, they do like children's stuff and like, yeah. like church stuff and yeah, you yeah. know stuff like we don't hear about. But you right, know, right. it's still. I think you're right. I don't think they do tons of things in there. But yeah. at the same time, like you know, like we think we're the center of the universe. Like if it's not a metal or a hardcore show, like it doesn't. Nothing else happens. It's like, well, yeah, it does. <laughs> right. I, actually. Yeah. Drew Wednesday, the Wednesday before this show, uh, Liam Gallagher played the Brooklyn. That's right. right. I, wish, I, I would like, I would like to, I would like to have seen that. Yeah, me too. Like, cause he, I think he does Oasis songs, and no, he doesn't. No, oh, he's not on this tour. No, 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 no. He's no, he's playing. He, he, he did one American show. This was it. Yeah. The because uh, they played Jimmy Kimmel or something. Oh. And, and and they did one American show. It's him. It's him and the dude from Stone Roses, right? Yeah, and, and, and that and album is good. All they do is that album, and they encore with Jumpin' Jack Flash. That's oh, it. Hey, Glenn Cummings, what's up, bro? Glenn. All right. Hey, you, yo, your name's gonna come up. Hello from Cape Cod. All right, Stephen. Thanks, man. Anybody you want to shout out on this Sunday? No, I'm all good today. All good. It was a great. You know what? Actually, I do want to shout out um, uh, Jason. From uh, who just joined the Ice Cold Killers, I was hanging with him last night. He's from the band The Give Ups. Yeah, yeah. And now he's playing guitar in the Ice Cold Killers as well. And we had hey, a great time that, yesterday. What's that over your shoulder? The I, the ID record. What is that? I don't even have. Oh, one of those. what is that? That is the test pressing. I don't get. And it, it's signed actually <laughs> by by Drew Stone. I don't even have one of those. <laughs> I give you a good price. They're like, hey, nah. sign this. Hey, hey, sign this. Okay. Boom. I don't even have it. You know what? I don't want it. Fuck it. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Thanks, man. See you. <coughs> Talk to you later. Oop. Bye bye. Who needs that? I don't want I don't want anything in this life. I don't want any of that shit. You know? Who has room? Not me. I live in a fucking studio, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trapped in here, bro. It's rent control. I can't go anywhere, you know? Yeah. Oh, you're a lifer. I'm a lifer. That said, let's bring our guest on. You know what? Let me let me do let me do uh let me do a just a sponsor shout out. Uh this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, the organic grill. 
The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Mad Vintage, and my friends and yours, 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise, like you, my friend. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. Let's bring back our friend Howie Abram, zum zums. So sure. let's um zum zum, and let's bring on our today's guest. Here we go. Today's guest is an American guitarist, singer, songwriter, and teacher, hailing from New York City. He's primarily known for his work with the pioneering thrash metal band Nuclear Assault. Please welcome, coming at us from Queens, New York, Mr. John Connell. Hey, man. Hey, oh. How are you? Hey, hey. Just another beautiful day in the mall. <laughs> How's Queens treating you? Queens is all right. Okay. Um, you know, it's not Manhattan, but then it's not Manhattan. You know? <laughs> are, are, you are you born Are you born in Queens? Uh, actually, I was born in Manhattan. But was, you know, spent most of my life in Queens. So you, so you were born in Manhattan. You live in Queens. I was born in Queens. I live in Manhattan. What Me about too. you, Howie? Born in Queens, live in Manhattan. There you go. Right on. Now, like I said, it's not Manhattan. Doesn't have the, all of the nightlife and the, the, the activities, but you're not know, stepping over homeless people either. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the nightlife is in Brooklyn anyway. Yeah. It's yeah, really I mean, not in Manhattan anymore. Well, it's you, all, you know, all, the, all the metal clubs are in Brooklyn. How'd that happen? Every one of them. We had one in Queens. And that's Wait, that, which which one now? What had past tense? Oh, you talk about like Lamore East? No, no, uh, Blackthorn Fifty One. Blackthorn, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah but yeah. the pandemic killed that. So it sure did. Already, you're getting comments on that guitar. John's got his baby with him. Love yep. that guitar. Could you show us what that? Which guitar that is? Uh, this is the Flying V that I played for most of my career. Uh, only recently retired it from touring because the neck was broken by baggage handlers, and I, unless I'm playing local, I don't take it out. It does. It doesn't fly anymore. Got it. Is it through the years? Have you done a lot of? Has that thing needed a lot of work? Have you had to refret it, or what? What's no. sort of the 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 history of it? Uh, I I, I think I replaced the pickups and I put uh, different pot uh, knobs on. That's it. Right. Everything else, as far as I can. Well, yeah, new tuning pegs. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I guess I had some work over the years. Makes it makes makes sense. Uh, so let's bounce the ball a little bit back and forth. I'm excited that you are here, and I'm excited that Howie's here. Um, always a fun show uh, when you're with when you when you're on the show, Howie. I appreciate it. Good to um, be. Oh, by the way, let's see. John and Jelly says, "Hey, Drew, please tell John and Howie I said hello." Hey, you just hey did. John. Ha hey, John, Howie. John and Jelly says hello. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. Please tell John we said hello. Okay. <laughs> John, Howie and John say hello as well. <laughs> so, so, so there you go. Long um, Island. Yeah, good, good. To, so how did you come up, John? Did you come up in a musical household? Yeah, how did music come into your life? You know, what's the first music that came into your orbit? All right, so uh, my family, you fell into one of two categories. You were musical and artistic or you were an athlete. And I got the musical and artistic gene. Uh, unfortunately for me, uh, the parents stopped giving out music lessons by the time I came along. I'm the youngest of six uh, because they felt not enough of us were continuing pursuing it in a meaningful way. So, uh, yeah, I was in high school before I picked up an, an instrument. The What's Brady the Bunch. <laughs> I forgot about the, the siblings. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh you Irish. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, you Irish with the big families. It gets better. Okay, Howie, you don't remember this, do you? Uh, see, my mother and her sister married my father and his brother. <laughs> I think I kind of remember that a little bit now that you're saying it. And the two families bought a house together in Queens, in, in wow. Whitestone. And between the two families, there were 15 kids growing up together. Well, that's kind of fantastic. That's kind of great. I mean, that, that, oh, yeah, that, was, yeah that, that, that must have been great growing up like that. Well, yeah. 
Yeah. Fortunately, what, what, this had enough bathrooms to go around. Yeah. <laughs> what What was the first music that 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 sort of you you were exposed to? Uh, it was the 1960s. So Beatles, Yes, Rolling Stones, all, you know, all the all that old fart music. <laughs> and this was in, and you grew up in Whitestone, Queens, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, did did anything? Did did you connect with anything? I mean, was there anything? What was the first music that you were pa that you heard that you felt connected to that you were passionate about? Uh, that would be uh, Fragile from Yes. Oh wow. Okay, I basically spent a good chunk of my lifetime studying the music on that album. Yeah, it's a great record. Oh yeah. Yeah. Were you into other sort of proggy, you know, like technical type stuff? Uh, yeah, you know, Kansas, I was a big fan of Kansas's earlier stuff. Uh, well, why am I drawing a blank on his name? The King, Crimson King. King, King Crimson. Oh, Robert Fripp. Fripp. Fripp, yeah. yes. Uh, you know, later on I discovered the McLaughlin and yeah, some of the right. stuff he was doing with uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Sure. Were you into like, you know, you became a guitar player, so were you particularly into guitarists? No, because guitar is the last instrument I picked up. <coughs> wow. All through high school, they were teaching me how to play or orchestral instruments, like right. all the, the woodwinds, uh, you know, sax, clarinet, flute, trumpet, you know, some brass. By the time I got out of high school, I played like 17 instruments. The guitar was not among them. Wow. So I did start teaching my last year in high school. I did start teaching myself how to play bass. <coughs> then, you know, that transitioned over to guitar. Right. And, and how does like metal make an appearance? Like, uh, was it, I mean, at one point it was kind of all hard rock, right? Like, so there wasn't a lot of separation between the, the, the genres or the subgenres, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, was it sort of Sabbath? Was it something else? Uh, I, I was never that huge a fan of Sabbath mm -hmm. stuff, to be honest with you. I mean, it was, it was good. <coughs> Excuse but, me. Uh, you know, I was into more progressive stuff. Uh, I don't think it was till uh, Unleashed in the East came out. You know that that was a to me that was a big moment in metal. Curtis Steel, um, Motorhead, of course, Ace of Spades. You know that was that was like a big short couple of years in metal that really kicked it into high gear in a, in a sense. It was that's an right incredible when, time. Oh yeah, well, that's right around when uh, uh, Iron Maiden released Killers. And I, yes, I yesterday, know. by the way, is the anniversary. Oh. No, today. So today is the day that the well the first Iron Maiden album and also British Steel came out the same day. Wow! Um, like you know, uh, eighty I guess it was. I, I'll take your word for it. I think it was eighty. Makes sense. Makes makes sense. But that period uh, was incredible. Like there was such great music coming out. Yeah, but the, the, the weird thing is that metal. The new wave of British heavy metal, it existed before those really right. came into American consciousness. You have bands right. like Angel Witch, yeah. and probably half a dozen I can think of if I sat down and thought about it. But, uh, you know, it was those, I think, from my perspective, British Steel, Unleashed in the East, Killers, Ace of Spades, those really broke into the American consciousness yes. in a big way. Well, those bands came over here and toured, right? So you found out about a lot of the earlier bands, like the 78, 79 era, New Wave of British Heavy Metal, um, you know, from like Kerrang! Magazine, right? You had yeah. to read about and, them. And Howie, who else was sort of in that in that glom? Was that Tigers well, of Pantang? Yeah, Saxon, you Saxon, know. Right, um, yeah, yeah, right. So Diamond, had, Diamond was a little bit later. Diamond, Diamond Head, right? Yeah, Girl School, oh, yeah. Um, you know, so a, every band that toured with Motorhead, Right. So <laughs> it's like, so, you, you know, you had your Angel Witch, like, so all the bands that were on the early, you know, compilations and stuff. And what's really interesting about it, too, I just read a book by Jeff Barton, who was from uh, Sounds Magazine, which was one of mm. the British papers yeah. um, around that time. And they were like one of the first papers to actually write about and give a shit about the new wave of British heavy metal. But they were also one of the first to like talk about punk and about and about oi right so yeah. like this this was one of those oh gary bushel wrote the book sorry gary bushel wrote the book and he was like sort of the like aficionado on like the the real british underground stuff yeah the, the anytime you see a documentary about that era gary bushel yeah 
And here's it's a like bunch three, of books three guys that turn up in every documentary you see right. about sort of that era. Jeff like, Barton is another one, but yeah, he, yeah. Gary Bushel was the one who like yeah. was like, no, this this magazine needs to cover this new wave of British yeah. heavy metal stuff. Right. And, you know, it was way before. Uh, I mean, Priest is dates back to the 70s. Yeah. It's, it's, that didn't right. start, you know, there. It, it, you know, um, Scorpions. Also, there you go. Malcolm Dome. There you go. Malcolm yeah. Dome's another That's one. The other dude. Yeah. Very good, Howie. Thank you. Hey, Howie. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a great, great period because, like, you know, what I don't see now is that discovery, right? That whole discovery of music that I think a bunch of us lived through, whether it's metal, punk, hardcore, whatever it was, was that, like, you hear about a band that's word of mouth, like you go to a record store, maybe you could even get the people from the store to play it for you. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, John probably remembers Ken's music box on union turnpike. Like it was a store in Queens near St. John's university that was one of the first that would carry those magazines and carry the early new wave of British heavy metal singles. I mean, you know, venom is, is, is 80. Right. So, you know, you're talking about like this period where by 80, like it was already getting like aggressive and dark, you know, like where where would thrash metal be without Motorhead and Venom? Um, you know, it's like it, it, it sort of sparked the whole thing. Um, and that was like the bands who wanted to be a little different than the technicality involved with Priest and Maiden. And, and, and I guess, I mean, just continuing on this on this timeline, and I guess these were huge influences on, you know, on, so, uh, on, you, of course, coming back on this way, like you mentioned, John, and, and the Metallica guys, right? They were usually influenced by, you know, by all that. And then I, I guess we'll get, we'll get to it soon is the whole tape trading culture. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, which is something that we, we touch on a lot on this show because it, it's, so, uh, it's so important because it was, it was such an incredible uh, network. John, g give us your take on sort of like that, that tape, and, and you know what? I, I I know I'm skipping. I know I know I'm skipping around a little bit, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put this photo up because uh, you know while we're here. But you know, here's one of the early nuclear assault um, demos, right? Yeah. I mean that that was how we how you guys did it, right, John? Yeah, it's my crappy hand. I think that's my crappy handwriting. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, but but yeah, uh, I remember when uh, we first got a hold of uh, Exodus's demo tape here on the east coast that was kind of a big deal for us right uh, but the, the quality was god awful because it had been copied so many times horrible yeah yeah you know, and how you mentioned compilation albums a couple of minutes ago i forgot all about those yeah uh, but yeah that was a that was a big way for people to figure out like well, who do i want to listen to next what, what album do i want to buy next it's like oh i like that song on that compilation album let me do that with the tape trading culture that was lively to say the least um you, we even had we even sold demo tapes in record stores yeah we would drop the stores off on consignment they'd sell them and then every now and again they'd say hey uh, you know we need more tapes we used to dub uh the second nuclear assault demo live suffer die <clears throat> we used to dub those on a double cassette boom box uh all over the place but in john's house at danny's house in my bedroom and then we print up the covers that were made on like the first sort of like Mac, you know, and bring them to Bleaker Bob's and whatever they, we would, people would sell them at shows. The band would sell them at their shows. And when you started to see the nuclear assault demos on people's tape trading lists, yeah. that's like the first indication that people gave a shit about the band, you know, yeah. because they were offering it to like trade with other people. And so it was almost like, you know, you being on like a top 10 list, you know, where people were like, oh, I have the Live, Suffer, Die demo, you know? And it was like, you know, your album getting reviewed or, or, or ranked on some kind of playlist. It's, an exci it's, it's, really, it's really an exciting network, you know? It, it's very, it, it, it was very uh, hands-on. It was tangible, you know? It's like you, you had something in your hands, you know? It, was, it's not, it wasn't just, you know dial it in and listen to it on the phone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so even think uh, back to vinyl, all right? You bought a, yeah. a gatefold album and it, it wasn't just the, the, the record. It was all the stuff that was yeah. packaged with it. 
you know, history Absolutely. of the band, biographies, yeah. weird stuff. Kiss yeah. Alive. Yep. It was like an adventure just to like deal with it. You know, well, you would go, you know, I remember you, you know, we'd go to the store, we'd go to the record store on Tuesdays because it was like the new release day. And, you know, you go to Tuesday, you go Tuesday and we'd spend hours in the store just like looking at everything and, and you know, it, it, who produced it, who did the artwork, who were they thanking, you know, what you're connecting the dots. Oh, this label. Oh, that's the, oh, you know, that's the label that was, you know, the, that's, that's right, Gabe, the thank you list. I mean, right. it, this was all, and you, it was like, uh, it was like, a uh, you know, uh, like an archaeological dig, you would connect the dots and sort of follow back to this guy. And yes, that's right, Lori. Lyric sheets, pose fair, all that. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so bringing us to, uh, so what was John? What was your first band, or at what point did you say, "Hey, I want to play music"? And how'd that go? Well, again, I got I got introduced to being a musician in high school, my first day. Um, <coughs> Howie, did you go to Bayside? No, I went to Van Buren, but I knew a ton of people at Bayside. Okay. Van Buren, hard. <laughs> All right. So Bayside High School is what's called a, a uh, presidential series building. There, ah. are thir there are 13 of them here in New York City. Tell us and they all have cool. the exact yeah. same floor plan. Wow. And day one, you know, my schedule said, okay, go to B30, you know, basement room 30. Uh, the only problem is... And nobody told you this up front. That section of the basement isn't completely separated from the rest of the building. So, like an idiot, I'm just going down a flight of steps to the basement. All right, B30, B30. Huh? What? 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 You know, I'm just totally confused. So, by the time I got to class, I was about 10 minutes late and I'm freaking out because I'm very obsessive, compulsive about being on time. I literally opened the door, and the music instructor's like, "What is it that you want to play?" I'm like, "Ah, <laughs> I don't know." Because <laughs> my sister plays flute. We have one at home. He said, "No, I got too many flute players. It's gonna be a clarinetist." I was like, "Okay, what's a clarinet?" You know. Uh, but yeah, I, I turned out I had I had some kind of a knack for this for doing musical instruments. Uh, and at the time, you had you know we had to have a full schedule. We didn't have to, but uh, it was recommended to have a full schedule in class. So I just, as I completed required courses, I started loading my schedule up with music classes. Uh, all happening before they made those atrocious cuts in in the school system that uh, did music away with a lot of those yeah. kind of programs. You know, there, there's a few things. Oh, well, some of this goes back to lawsuits. Mm. All right. So the uh, ACLU sued the Department of Edu Education over what they felt was minority people being fast-tracked into vocational schools. Mm. So they'd be offered shop classes in automotives, in metalworking, in electrical. I took all those classes. Well, mm -hmm. not the automotive, but I took the woodworking, the, you know, all these hands-on practical skill-based classes. And, you know, lo and behold, you know what a carpenter makes or, or electrician? Right. Those are not low wage jobs. Yeah, that's right. But the, the, the theory was, well, everybody should go to college and have a degree and get a, a job doing that. So, the Department of Education cut, gutted most of those programs. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, it's like, well, who are you going to get to frame your house? Who are you going to get to do your plumbing? Who are you going to get to wire your, your house up? Yeah. 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 The um, machine. That's who. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, a lot of those guys have those jobs. Yeah. How, how, so, how did the first. How did and when did you pick up guitar and what was the first band, John? Uh, picked up guitar after high school, and the first band was actually Anthrax, right? And how, so did, I, how did that? I was going to say to go about? back a little bit, like connecting yeah. the high school and all that, right? right? So a bunch of people went to Bayside High School, right? So you had Scott Ian, yeah, all, all of us did, right? You had Danny, um, obviously you have Craig Satari's brother who was a connection for a lot of people there. And then didn't uh, John Big Charlie go there? Uh, no, he went to Flushing. Oh, he went to Flushing. I thought he played high school, at, uh, football at Bayside High School. No, he, was, he played. High, he did play high school football, but it was Flushing High School, if yeah, I remember Flushing. correctly. Okay. Man, did, I mean, did, did all you guys, John, did all <laughs> you guys, you and Scotty, and, and did you all grow up in the same neighborhood, or was it sort of like – all sort of around in the in the vicinity, so to speak. Well, uh, we're 
most of the guys are from Bayside. I'm the odd guy out. I was from Whitestone. Ah, right. Um, but we, yeah, Danny and I started hanging out together because, you know, we were in some of the same music classes. Scott was in one, uh, Satari was in one of those classes. Right. Uh, and then you're hanging out with those guys. You get introduced to the other people. Um, the way Anthrax came about, there was a battle of the bands, and we just said, hey, let's throw together a set and uh, compete. Um, and, and, so, who, and, and who who was less? Who, who was who was it, who was on the team at that moment? Okay, that would be uh, myself on vocals, Danny on rhythm guitar, Scott Ian on lead, Dave Weiss on drums, Paul Kahn on bass. Wow. Did you guys play covers? We did covers. I don't recall us having any. I think we just started working on original music. Right. We, we might have even played one. I, I can't recall, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, and, I remember and, you know, hearing those, about that. Those guys are from Bay Terrace, right? Was it Bay Mostly, Terrace? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it's funny because like Dan and Scott lived basically across the street from one another, and and John lived about really only about ten minutes up the road, um, but you know, it's a whole other town. Um, it felt it felt kind of far away. It's really weird, but it like was very close actually. Um, but but you know the the, the Scott Satari connection you know that's going back yeah. later it's like that's how you know Danny met Craig, and you know wound up teaching him bass and all those things and you know Craig will always throw so much love at Danny about like you know he cites so much he cites Danny Lilker is is being huge early influence on him as a bass player. Yeah. yeah. But he was a little kid at the time. His brother's a little yeah. bit older. And, um, but yeah, a lot happened in that Bayside high school that led to a lot of things, you know? Um, but, but yeah. So, so what happens with Anthrax after you'd play the battle of bands, but you know, you, your time there was a little bit short lived. What was that? What was that about? Uh, honestly, I'm not even sure at this point. I don't, uh, yeah. I don't really recall. I just, they felt that they wanted to go with somebody else. It was a fairly amicable split. Right. Uh, still friends with those guys, as far as I know, to, to, to today. <laughs> um, we did a festival with them a couple of years back, and everybody was having a great time hanging out. You know. But but you meet Dan at that time in your music classes and all that. And so <clears throat> you're no longer in Anthrax, but you guys stay connected. And... How did that ultimately lead to like this partnership that you guys had for so long? Well, I, when they decided to let me go, I told Danny, uh, keep me in mind when they kick you out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was going to happen, but it happened. And uh, he was pissed off. He called me up and said, oh, we're going to do something heavier than anthrax. It's like, okay, great. Let's go. Right. Oh, right. Uh, GY6 Madness. I'm not sure who this is. Says you cats did Zeppelin. Good times, bad times. Yep, that was later on. Much yeah. later, yeah. But oh, yeah, oh. I'm fine with it. I'm a, I'm a huge Zeppelin fan. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Thanks. so like, who, who? So you you have this discussion. Let's do something heavier, you know, than than Anthrax. And so, like, do you just did you get band members? Did you start just writing the music? The two of you, like, how did it sort of kick off? We started writing music, just the two of us. All right. The earlier stuff, pretty, from Game Over to The Plague, the earlier demos, the music was pretty much a 50-50 split between me and Dan. Um, as time went by, more and more got shoved on to me for a couple of reasons. Um, one was that uh, Danny was drifting away from thrash metal and getting into more extreme stuff. Yeah. Uh, another reason was that the guys had a habit of deciding, oh, let's go into the studio and record an album. I'm like, we only have six songs. We need ten. Right. And I, I just for whatever reason, I happened to be the one who was able to put together music in a really short time frame. Hmm. One, one album, I wrote a song the night before we went into the recording studio. Yeah, and it turned out to be one of the better songs on the album. It's like, but it's it, it's not sustainable. No, but it's not that uncommon anymore. But you can't, you certainly can't do a majority of an album that way. Well, and and again, to me, the it was always okay. Uh, I'm going to go dive into martial arts as a reference just because Please. You know, it works. Uh, I have black belts in multiple disciplines. I have a fourth degree black belt in karate. And across all the different Asian martial arts, when they don't use the word black belt, they 
called a shodan or shodan, depending on your dialect. And that doesn't mean expert. It means beginner level. It means that you now you're a black belt. Now you can start training. You can start actually really learning. And to me, this was always what being signed to a, a label was like. Okay, you have an album deal? Great. That's not the time to sit back and rest. That's the time to remember there are a thousand bands right behind you who are ready to take your place. And you got to right work harder and harder and make make sure that the quality that you're producing is up there. I don't think the other guys ever really figured that out. And I right. didn't know how to articulate it. Sure. And, and, and Howard, you know this, being an A&R guy, it's like you sign a band, their first record of the songs that they've been playing a couple of years For that, while, that, yeah. that, that, that are really honed and tight and really fine-tuned. The second record, they sort of have to write you know, really fast, months. really fast. The third record, they're they're like making it up in the studio as they go well, along. That, that's that's the thing. There's the whole like you have your whole life to do the first album, yeah. you know, and then you're basically on a schedule, you know. So right. it's a very very different thing. It's like okay, like our touring cycle is over, whatever. The press has died down. It's time to do another one, and it's like okay, where do we start? You know, it was sort of, uh, it you know. It, it goes from like organic to very calculated mm -hmm. and you know so it's a little tricky i would imagine but you know one thing and we'll, we'll get into this as we get into you know future nuclear salt albums i found that you guys got better like you sort of figured it out as you went that for for a few albums there i don't know if you realized that you sort of were nailing it you know but you know after let's say the plague you know, when you're getting into survive and you're getting into, you know, handle with care, like some something clicked, like you guys sort of found this rhythm, you know, amongst the whole band, I think even, and just got better at it when you didn't have all that time to write. It's interesting because a lot of bands start to fall apart that way. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think Danny and I just figured out how to get the most out of our partnership. Mm hmm. Um, you know, but, but again, like when you're talking about handle with care, that's right around the time when Danny was starting to check out as a writer. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I mean, you yeah, know, Glenn was always a monster on the snare drum. I mean, there isn't a better snare artist out there as far as I'm concerned. And I, th I think, uh, just learning how to take advantage of everybody's strengths. Yeah, because I feel like the material like that you wrote, there was always still going to be fast songs and things like that. But like your, you know, like normal up tempo and mid tempo stuff, like some of that to me was the best that you guys ever did. And, you know, one thing that I really, really want to, um, you know, touch upon is the lyrics, um, because I think one of the most important things, aside from like, your attitude and the groundedness of you and Dan specifically um, being around like this, this growing scene at the time actually became so prominent, like the whole thrash metal crossover, whatever you want to call it. But the lyrics to me really set you guys apart because when you were doing it, no one was talking about the topics, you know, that you guys were and you specifically, I was still very uh, Satan based, <laughs> you know, and like sort of, uh, you know, people trying to find like generic aggressive topics, but you guys went some places that, you know, other bands just didn't go. And like, you know, I'm sure that was conscious, but like what made you comfortable to go into these different places lyrically? Okay. Well, we, we started out like everybody else, you know, we, doing satanic themes you know because oh yeah this thing about evil because that's, that's heavy metal yeah yeah you know? uh but it wasn't too far into the process i i, I decided you know I, I i'm not i'm not a huge fan of this all right uh if i want to put the effort into writing a set of lyrics i want it to mean something and that, that's that's when we started doing political and environment and social topics right right and you know and i think some of that too, I think a bunch of that was just you, but also, you know, the <laughs> high life of agony. Um, Sorry about that. The, the, the scene at the time was transitioning, right? So you had this crossover that really began to happen. Um, you know, 
between the metal and the hardcore thing. And, you know, the shows started to look the same. The CB's matinee started to look like the Lamore show and, you know, that type of stuff as far as like the people who were showing up. But the bands that, you know, were in the mix with that time. Yeah, here's CBGB's 86. Yeah, that's my baby. Yeah, and 80, 80, it's a it's 1986 nuclear salt at CBGB's uh, I think, Frank White I th photograph. I think this month, I think that's April 86, actually. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, but like the lyrical content when these scenes started to merge, um, that type of lyrical approach became a little bit more prominent than and the Satan stuff started to go out the window for the most part. Like how influenced were you by like the punk and hardcore bands of the time as well of like the 85, 86, you know, period. Not as much as you would think. Um, okay. Yeah. You know, just that the, the, the lyrical thing was, was literally just, you know, I don't, I don't want to sing about satanic themes because it's a dead end. There's nowhere to right. go with it. You know, how, many, how do you, how do you listen to a whole I mean, Venom? Okay, whole album is nothing but satanic lyrics. Right. Okay, this is entertaining, but after a while, it's like you know you want something more, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, yeah, I just realized I can't, I can't do this for a whole album. Yeah, yeah. But Thank you, you, how important were some of these topics to you? Like, because you really you touched upon animal rights, you talked about environmental issues, you know, things that you know, uh, other people started to do later, but coming from like a metal place for the most part, nobody was doing that. No one, you know, and you guys did. And that really came from you. Like, you know, how much were those types of things a part of your life or your consciousness, you know, in terms of deciding to write about them? Well, I, I, you know, I've, I've always been a news junkie. Um, you know, these days I'm uh, very, you know, for the last 30, 30 or so years, I've been a political news junkie as well. Uh, <laughs> so these are the subjects that are impinging on social consciousness. So that's that's where the material comes from. Unfortunately, it seems like the same thing over and over again. Yeah. So uh, that whole thing of repetitiveness in your lyrics is starting to come back and haunt me. It's like, oh, okay, I can I can write another song about being censored, so, or or another song about something horrible happening with animals, or yeah, where does it end? <laughs> Well, hey, I, gotta, time... I, I, I just real Go quick. Ahead. I got. I got to say. Um, I got to say, yo, Joe, Joe Affy, what's up? Thanks for stopping by, and also, Jimmy Hazel. Jimmy, Jimmy Hazel. Hazel, what's up? Yes, John Connolly, <laughs> Howie Abrams. Good, good to see. Thank you, Jimmy. Good to see you. And, and you, to, Drew. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 good. Good to see. Uh, good to see you too, Joe Affy. And nice to know that Brooklyn. You know, Brooklyn is uh, Brooklyn is watching, and uh, also, um, yeah, there, there you go, a couple, a couple others. But yeah, is that Papa Chubby Chubby? The game over cassette was huge for me, I, I, absolutely. Um, I, I'm sorry. That that said, um, and I, I I know this. I know we're kind of talking about those kind of early days. Uh, here's a, so Anthrax Nuclear Salt at Lamore. Th this is is this a Howie Abrams flyer? It is a Howie Abrams flyer and Charlie, you know, who drew the original Sergeant D character for SOD, um, drew this specifically for the flyer um, because I believe this was the very first time that Nuclear Assault played with Anthrax um, at Lemoore. There were many of those shows later on. Um, I think this was the first time because the other times a lot of those situations were two nights. Um, and so Anthrax would do these kind of like underplay, you know, once a year shows uh, sure. at, at Lemoore when they become sort of a pretty big band at that point. And they would bring nuclear, nuclear salt with them. And those shows were great because it was really it was very, uh, you know, like Bayside in the building, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And uh, and those those were always really, really fun shows. Here's John, you remember any of those? Oh yeah, Lemoore's was a scary venue to headline at. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's a 1500 capacity hall, standing room only. Yeah, uh, you're backstage, and half an hour before you go on, you poke your head out, and the place is empty. Right. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Actually, and you're just freaking out like, "Holy crap! Are we going to play to an empty room tonight?" 
Right. You go downstairs, you get your stuff together, you come back out, and all of a sudden, the place is packed full. It's like, what the, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, it was a weird place that way, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it was terrifying. It had to do with the drinks. People would just drink outside on, on 62nd Street, and they wouldn't come in until the last minute, so they didn't have to buy, which at the time probably seemed like really expensive beer, which was probably four bucks. Five. Uh, here, here's another one of, of kind of that era, which is, you know, uh, nuclear solid animal hall. Oh, oh, the worst, it, the worst it, place ever. I mean, wow. I mean, how'd you get roped into that one? <laughs> well, that, if I remember correctly, that, that was a benefit concert. Ah. Animal okay. Um, so animal hall was a, a, a biker place. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a rider. I don't, I've been on a motorcycle, I think twice in my life. Right. Uh, and I tend to be very respectful of people who do ride. <laughs> So we're, we're in there and we're hanging out with the bikers and they're like, hey, why don't you get on our bikes and take a picture? I'm like, uh, I don't ride. I'm not really comfortable with that. Like, get on the bike and take a picture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they had that big coffin when you walked in full of yep. beer. That was the beer cooler. Wow. That's... So, uh, so uh, who, who were your peers, John? Like, like when, when in, that early, in that early circuit that, that you were doing, like 86, 87, like – who 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 were your peers? Who 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 are you like, you know, playing with a lot? And and and, and you know, who was in the mix back then? We, with you, you. a lot of them on the flyer. Yeah, yeah. You know, Ludacris. We, I think we had a rehearsal space like across the hall from them for a while. Uh, Blood Feast was always you know we did, did a bunch of shows with those guys. Uh, let's see, you had uh, Pete Steele's band, Carnivore. Yeah, the original right. carnivore was, was out. Hades from New Jersey. Sure, remember Savage yeah. Thrust. Savage Thrust, uh, Virgin Steel. <laughs> Virgin Steel. Yeah, look at this. Look at this CBGB show. This is a this is a very interesting one. It's like Nuclear Assault with a bunch of New York hardcore bands. It's like Straight Ahead, Nuclear Assault, The Mob. Yeah, interesting. This is this yeah. is a show. Uh, uh, when when you played these, when you when you played some of these matinees, John, was it was it awkward? Like hardcore bands and then Nuclear Assault, or was there any tension, or, or was it were you guys like really accepted by 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 that crowd? Well, Scott, Dan, and I were regulars at the matinees, right? So they got used to seeing us around, and you know, then when we were going on stage, like, oh, hey, Connelly's here. All right, cool. Very accepting. Yeah, that was very much what it was like at the time because of the fact that you were regulars, you know. And, you know, by that time, like, the scene was still also very small at the time. So you got to know people yeah. pretty quickly, right? So, yeah. like, John and Danny, like, they knew Vin Stigma. They knew Jimmy. They knew Big Charlie, who was a, the bouncer, Billy Psycho. Like, it, it was one big thing you know and even like the video that you showed to open the show drew that yeah. that cb show from 86 which may it was the first or second time they played cbs um you know basically you'll see and i remember this um is there's a you if facing the stage you see a bald head that keeps sort of jumping up and throwing their arms up in the air that's todd youth you know wow. And he's like dancing to nuclear assault. But what was really funny and why I really remember that is because we used to stand around and judge people's like dancing styles. And that thing that he used to do was called the um, game show contestant <laughs> because he used to jump up in the air and throw his arms up in the air. Like he just like got on the prices, right. And they just called him up to the stage. And so we called that one, the game show contestant. Hey, how are Look at yes. We, I don't remember the band. There was some neo-Nazi band from out of town playing at CB's, so they had all the, the Nazi skinheads show up for the gig. Uh, a bunch well, of Nazi skinheads from New Jersey. Well, you at that show where the, they all start Sig Heiling in front of the stage, and then Big Charlie just walks up behind him and crosses his arms and looks down at these kids. I and sort of like, vaguely remember that. I uh, also remember, remember the band Blessed Death? Sort of, yeah. From Jersey? Um, so Blessed Death did a night show at CB's. And for some reason at the 11th hour, AF got added to the show. Like they wanted Ooh. to play sort of a metal show. Right. Uh -huh. 
And Blessed Death had this song called Into the Ovens, which was a little difficult to interpret. Um, so, you know, this is a- after AF does their first, you know, U.S. tour and has to live down being like these New York Nazis from like Maximum Rock and Roll and all this stuff. And now they're playing this show with Blessed Death. And this guy's all high pitched, like into the ovens, you know, like, and so it didn't go well. And I just remember like all the New York people basically like feet first stage diving on their seven fans um, that were in front of the stage and like making sure, making sure they couldn't finish their set. Was this CB's? At CB's, but it was at night. And so it was, it was, it was rough. So this is a great shot that Bill Bill O'Leary sent from 1986. Yeah, Chuck um, Valley, and and so you see Chuck Valley on the uh, on the bottom right on the left, and then I feel like the reason that he would kind of be there would be it's this is the this could be the flyer. This is a a 1986 flyer from CB's. This is probably that show, right? It's Nuclear Assault, Ludacris. Well, there were a few. Few yeah. Nuclear Assault, okay. Ludacris shows. I see. Okay. I sent you another flyer that Glenn Cummings actually made. Mm-hmm. For, but that was, oh, sorry, that's a Lamore show. Yeah, that one's right. Lamore show. Yeah, this is this is a CB show. It would make sense, you know? So, yeah. So, so Howie, uh, I mean, and, and, and John, uh, so how does the combat, how does combat enter the picture here? And, and, and how does that... How does that play out? Metallica. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when John Zazula signed Metallica, they released their first album. I think pretty much every record company in, in the country took a look and said, oh, my God, this is a real thing. We should yeah. we gotta dive into this. Uh, Combat was part of Important Records Distributors. Uh, Important Record Distributors was dealing mostly with uh, New Age music, uh, Broadway soundtracks, yep. stuff like that. The Miserable. Uh, yeah. So then they started getting into some of the punky stuff like Black Flag. Um, and, you know, just, just scouting out, looking for this new thrash metal phenomenon so they could sign bands. Yeah, they signed Megadeth. So it was, uh, Steve Sinclair, right? And yep. he, <clears throat> he signed Megadeth. Uh, they signed Exodus through this Tarred Records, you know, label. Um, you know, and a few of those bands like started to, you know, get record deals. So between like sort of Metal Blade and Roadrunner was a little a minute away, but Combat and Megaforce, like between those three labels, they kind of signed up a bunch. Now you of you 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 bands. you work you worked out there in Hollis, right, Howie? What, what, yeah, was I wasn't. Com- was, what was I it? wasn't combat, there yet. Combat in effect. Relativity. And- and relativity, right? So, but relativity was sort of the parent record label. Like their I big see. thing at the time was, as John said, this Le Miserable soundtrack. Right. And but they also which was, had, which was huge, huge. But then they also had Joe Satriani now, yep. and so Joe Satriani starts to break through with this. Fucking love that record. Album. <laughs> in like 88 or so that was and it became you know it was a platinum record of like instrumental guitar rock right yeah. and then so they have that then in 87 i believe 86 they combat starts this combat core imprint so right. now they're putting out records with as howie uh Teitler here says yes combat core they did a label where they um basically um they signed like the Circle Jerks. They put out a Circle Jerks record, or like a, the GBH record. But then they also signed Agnostic Front, and they signed Ludacris, and they signed the Crumb Suckers, and things like that. So you had like Nuclear Assault on Combat, you know, proper, let's say, sure. and then you had like this Combat Core thing. But all these bands were part of the same scene by this point, right? Mm-hmm. It was all one thing. They're all playing shows together. There's no real difference there. You know, Megadeth becomes sort of Megadeth and whatever becomes part of this whatever big four. And, you know, but then you have like, um, you know, the, the Testaments of the World and those types of bands that were also starting to get really popular around the same time. Um, but yeah, and John, you worked in the warehouse at Important too, didn't you? I did. Oh, I wow. Know, I did Dan, not know that. Everybody did. Is that right? The, 
the all-star bands you could form from the people who worked in that <laughs> warehouse. And that was and that was in Hollis. Well, first uh, in, first in Jamaica. Oh right. Well, not not too far from the JFK. That's right. J by Guy R. Brewer Boulevard. Yes. And and, and the well, reason that they were by the airport is because they they're called important because they would bring in a lot of imports and they wanted it to be cheaper to get them from the uh, airport to their warehouse. So they had the warehouse right near the airport. And this was the first release on combat, correct? Yep. Yep. Uh, could you uh, give us some background on it, John? Uh, any re any recollections on recording it, or and well, and where and how and why? Yeah. Well, we uh, did the recording at Pyramid Studios in Ithaca, New York. Oh yeah. Uh, producer Alex Perialis. Yep. Who had just finished working on Metallica's first release. He'd done Overkill. Anthrax. Yeah, Anthrax. Okay, yep. so uh, we were looking forward to working with him, really. Um, but I I don't know how I got talked into this. His when we got into the studio, he sat us down for a long talk, and he's like, "Look, I want to I want to try a different sound approach on the guitars." And uh, I don't know how he talked me into it, but that's where that really thin, anemic mm. guitar sound comes from. Mm. It haunts me to this day. Uh, I want to hear that album redone with different guitars, like right yeah. now, you know? Yeah. It wouldn't, with, with today's technology, it wouldn't even be hard. You throw the, throw the, uh, the original tape on, you could run it through a process and change the guitar sound 100%. That's Great right. Great cover. Yep, this is that Alan Rupp's orange phase. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How he's laughing because uh, we used to joke that he got discounts on certain colors of paint. He must have, because there's so many Ed Repka covers from that period that are the same color scheme. Yeah. yeah. It's either the, this kind of yellow and orange or the kind of purplish covers. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Ed, Ed Repka really did a lot of stuff within a the lot. like, yo, he did the first Biohazard record. He did this. He did Circle Jerk. I, I, guess, I guess you guys, I guess uh, Combat was a client, right? Because he did the Circle Jerks. I'm thinking now these are all kind of, the, the same label he was doing work for. Yeah, he did a bunch. It was like the death metal thing later with, uh, I guess Ed Repka did a lot of the death metal covers later. Um, and he, he definitely had the style, but I really like this one because it's sort of like, right. there's aside from like the guy who looks like he's about to be on fire in the very front, yeah. um, it just, the colors really work obviously. And like, right. it's a mushroom cloud. So what are you going to do? Like make it purple, but um yeah. You know, it's just like, it's so, it's iconic. Like, you know exactly what this is. You know, and, and I, I know, you know, of course, the contingent, like Chico says, change nothing. Right. Like, it, 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 it's interesting, right? People, pe people become, <laughs> you know, uh, acclimated or, or this is a huge record for a lot of people. It's inconceivable for, right. for, for it to sound anything like that. But, you know. Well, I remember I had a conversation with um, Metallica's manager a few years back because they started putting out these box sets of their their older albums. Sure. And so, you know, it's notorious that there's no base on Injustice for All. And right. so I said, like, oh, you're going to re-release it. You know, why don't you do a version with bass on it? And he's like, you know, we actually sat down and talked about that because we're, we're painfully aware of what fans say about that album. And he goes, the the guys won't do it. They're like, that's what we made. That it's yeah. a time, you know. It, 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 it's it's a, you know, a piece at a moment in time, and everybody knows it that way. And we're just going to leave it as is. Yeah, I can see. I can see that. That, that, that makes sense. Um, and and then sort of moving forward, you know, with with, with combat. One thing, in sort of looking at the history, which is like, <laughs> I, I sort of. I, that I sort of didn't understand is combat IRS then combat, then IRS again. And I'm like, how do you do that? I've, I've never seen anything like that. What, what, what's, what's sort of, I, I'm talking about for those out there, you know, there's a, a record on combat, then the next record's on IRS metal. And then the next one's on in effect. Then the next one's on IRS. What's the story with that? Okay. I don't know how miles Copeland talked anybody at, Relativity into this, and of course, <laughs> IRD, important record yeah. system it is. But uh, he came up with. We were starting to break, and Miles came up with the idea of let's do a joint venture with Nuclear Assault between 
Important Records and his label. Um, and he's managing you at the time as well, right? He, we had just signed a management deal with him. And uh, I think his pitch was something to the effect that it would be beneficial as far as advertising budgets were concerned to have the band go back and forth. But it never really worked out terribly well at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's interesting that, that Miles... I have, I have a whole backstory on that if you want it. Yeah, yeah but let me just say also, Miles Copeland managing Nuclear Assault? That, yeah. Uh, uh, huh? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it, it didn't work out terribly well. Right. The police and Nuclear Assault. <laughs> Did you did you interact with him a lot, John? Uh, no, we <laughs> met him. A, we met him a couple of times. We mostly dealt with him with one of his assistants. Yeah, yeah. I, what was that guy's name? I forgot. I'm trying to remember. Nice guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because he's the only guy there I ever talked to. You know, right. um, I, I met Miles once at one of your shows, and like it was like a hi, Miles Copeland. See you later. You know, was, yeah. there was No discussion or anything. Uh, I, I, Howie, maybe you have to, but like, how does Nuclear Soul come on Miles Copeland's radar screen? Because metal was on everybody's radar, right, you right, know, right, and, right, and, right. and and the, the sure. bands, the style of Nuclear Soul, the thrash metal crossover, whatever you want to call them bands were now happening. They were yeah. selling out shows and selling records and it was a thing. And so they wanted to be a part of that thing. But interestingly, they didn't really sign any quote unquote peer bands to you. They only sort of signed like these weird, like non-committal hard rock metal bands uh, other than you. And I always thought that was weird. So it was sort of like, well, let's sign like a couple of different kinds of metal and see what happens. That's what it felt like because there was no follow up on IRS to nuclear assault. There was no other band. Right. Well, I think, uh, this is going to sound critical of Miles Copeland. I don't intend it that way. I think this is just how he plays the game, is that he looks for something that's already successful, yeah. and then he tries, tries to find something similar to it and yeah. releases that. So, for example, uh, what was Susanna Hoff's? Oh, the Bangles. 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 Okay, so they were hitting huge at one point and, uh, on their first debut album. Uh, and I, I ended up ended up working for a band called the Rebel Pebbles as a stage tech, which was- I love it, the Rebel Pebbles. <laughs> Rebel Pebbles, as this was Miles's attempt to duplicate the success of the Bangles. Right. Okay, all-girl band. Uh, one of them was from an, another group. I don't remember which, I'm sorry. Uh, but but again, he, he, I don't think he was much as a, an innovator as somebody yeah. who could spot a trend and try to jump onto that trend. Sure. Well, it sounds like a major label. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what they do. And, you know, basically it, it's you know, it's certainly not a new story. You know, it's like something that we've heard a million times. But, you know, the thing is that I think I remember the band not being that happy with the way things went with Game Over and Combat. So there was this desire to try to do better. And, you know, and I don't remember how like you came across um Miles, like I don't know how that happened. Like that's you know, what I'm saying. Like, like you know, did he just call you one day, or like how did that happen? I have no idea to this day. Right, Honestly. right. That's wild. And so, so he comes into the picture, and like at the time, if you're like you know one of a bunch of thrash metal bands, and up, you're seeing other bands sort of get treated a little better, or getting a little bit more marketing and publicity, and this, this, and that, you know, you you want that too, and so when he came up with this wacky fucking idea of like do the next record on IRS and then they go back to like the relativity family. Um, it sounded great. And, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, I thought they did a decent job with survive, which was the next album. I mean, it was visible. Um, you guys really toured so that you made videos. It was, you know, like at least resembled what was supposed to be happening. Right. And did this, did this, this, uh, Slayer that was that, that was eighty eight. Yeah, yeah. That must so have been. Things, yeah. So these things started to happen, you know. Right. That was a fun yeah. tool. Uh, yeah. Did you did you guys fare well for opening up for the infamous like opening band Killer Crowd Slayer? I mean, did you guys did you you guys do okay? Yeah. Oh I yeah, think, I would think so, man. I would think so. 
Yeah, pe people came to see both bands, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we even did a, a tour with uh, Slayer, Exodus, and Nuclear Assault. I mean, yeah. people weren't waiting outside. They were pushing to get in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, the there, boys. There you go. I mean, pe Nuclear Assault was killing in Europe by that point. Like, Damn, I'm short. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that and Dan is really tall. Yeah. Um, but he, so he makes you look even shorter. You're kind of like fitting in with the other guys. But, you know, I remember, and I w always wanted to ask you about this, like, because Nuclear Assault went over, and I remember your first uh, show overseas was at Dingwalls in the UK, which mm. was a legendary punk club in England. And I, so for me, like, sitting in New York and, like, having helped make demo tapes and flyers and stuff for your band and being such a huge fan of the band – I had like the, you know, like the little league vibes, like, you know, they made it overseas, you know what I mean? Little league dad vibes. And so, you know, and then not that long, it kind of, you know, England things happen fast. And so not that long later, you're like headlining Hammersmith Odeon, you know? And, you know, to me, I think uh, uh, certainly American bands and even bands outside the U S like, they're always like, I can't wait to play Madison square garden, but for like the UK, Hammersmith Odeon was the fucking place. And so you went over there first and you were opening for like Adam Craft or whatever it was, right? And yeah, Agent Steel. And it, oh, Agent Steel and Adam Craft was on the bill though, but Agent Steel was the headliner. And then um, like a minute later, it seemed you're headlining Hammersmith Odeon. Like, was that ever a place, you know, growing up? being you know aware of the new wave of british heavy metal and all that were you like i i hope we get to play hammersmith odeon i i gotta be honest with you i was hopelessly ignorant about the music scene in, in england right uh, i thought it was a big deal that we played lemurs like 10 times in one year right. yeah. <laughs> that, that that seems to come up a lot you know it's like lemur was a the Lamour was the was the shout out to the, igor cavalera on the on yeah the man what's up igor i i I see what you're doing out there, bro. Miss you. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by, Igor. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, let me let's do this, fellas. Let, let me take let's take a sponsor break for a couple minutes. Let me run let me run some promos and talk about some upcoming shows. And we'll come back and, and let's talk about handle with care. And we'll talk about the trail of tears video that 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 we all did together and we'll move forward. So I'll see you guys in a minute, okay? Cool. There you have it. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today is John Connolly from Nuclear Assault, co-hosted by Howie Abrams. We're going, we're going deep. Uh, we're getting into it. Good to see you, Igor. Uh, I want to, I want to shout out John Wolf with the, with the super chat. Thank you. Hey, John. Uh, you, 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 any question you want to ask, ask it. Super chat, front of the line. There you go. Uh, we're gonna go a little long today. Uh, we're having a good time with this one. I hope you are too. Let's hear from our sponsors. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Will that be cash or in debt? Do you mean debit? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Another eternal satisfying customer. <laughs> hey, guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger. We have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do. And we are happy to see you guys.
Peace, what it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dob, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go. Skate decks all day, baby. We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, pops. People love the pops. Star Wars. <laughs> We are New York Hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it on. Come on now, get your shoes and socks on. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Hey, I know what you're thinking, some of you out there. Yo, I love this show. How can I support it? Funny you should ask. Let me tell you. There's a Patreon page. Please join us on Patreon. There's a $2 tier, a $5 tier, so on and so forth, uh, exclusive content, free shit. Everybody loves free shit, right? Uh, please support the show that supports you. That's how we've enabled. We've been enabled. Come be an enabler. Why not? It's okay to enable this show. Uh, there's a PayPal address there. Also, there's a super chat function, uh, which... Uh, John Wolf did earlier on a show. If you do a super chat, it comes through in color. I can't miss it. Ask a question for the guest. Come right to the front of the line, uh, please. So uh, that said, yeah, support the show, uh, the show that supports you. Want to talk about a couple upcoming shows? Um, new music show. Not so. So there's no show. There's no show Wednesday. There's no so. Sh there's no no show. Sunday, because I'm doing, all right, let, let me get, let me, there's, next up, let's take it chronologically for Christ's sake, right? Let, let, let me, let me do this chronologically. This Saturday, I'm going to be up at Bridge Nine Records. I am moderating the From Punk to Monk Ray Capo book event. That is at Bridge Nine Records this Saturday, April 20th from two to four. The next day. I'm hustling my ass back to New York. It is the Back to the New York Hardcore Chronicles Roots Series. We are back all ages, free Sunday matinees on the Barry. This Sunday with Faded Line, Car Bomb Parade, Brick by Brick, Kings Never Die, and Fahrenheit 451. Chronologically after that, Wednesday, April 24th, we're doing a new music show. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put out a new flyer. All kinds of people coming through, new music, new events, this and that. Uh, Sunday, April 28th, Sal and Dan from Electric Frankenstein, co-hosted by Joel Ghostin. Sal from Typo Negative Life of Agony, a pale horse named Death and King of the Locusts on Sunday, May 5th. Our friend Peter Spirer, who uh, executive produced the Michael Alago film with me, uh, who has had an incredible career as a filmmaker. He also has the Book of Rhyme and Reason out, the hip-hop book. Lots to talk about with Peter. I'm excited about this one. I hope you are too. Steve Hansgen from Minor Threat, Government Issue, Second Wind, will be on Sunday, May 19th. Always excited when we have a Minor Threat guy on the show. Come on now, it's the Castle Heights reunion, a.k.a. the Castle Fights reunion. Sunday, May 26th, with Gary Mutley from Billy Club Sandwich and Phil Vibes, Vibes from Irate. Wednesday, May 29th, drummer Chris Enriquez, who is now in Orange 9 Millimeter, also in Spotlights, will be on the show. And old school, New York Hardcore represent Jack Rabbit from Even Worse will be on the show Sunday, June 9th. Also, he uh, did the big takeover fanzine, now the big, o big takeover uh, magazine. So that said, uh, lots going on uh, with the show. You know what? Let me get all this shit out of the way now. Might as well. Uh, also, hey, in Tompkins Square Park on the 27th of April, coming up fast, it is a Jesse Mallon benefit with Go Go Bordello, Madball, Murphy's Law, The Captures, and War Orphan. Come on down. Uh, our show up at Bridge Nine with, Laurie, with our own Laurie Dorn from Women of the Pit, Mike Gallup from AF, and Christopher Michonne. Uh, of course, the Black and Blue Bowl, two days coming up. 
uh, uh, May 18th and 19th. We are back in our beloved Tompkins Square Park, Saturday, May 25th. Redwoods featuring Colton Schuler, Danny Schuler from Biohazard Sun, Cartel, non-residents, incendiary device. It's going to jump off tonight. And Rebelmatic. Rampage Fest. Speaking of Hegs, Sunday, June 2nd. Two stages, seven bands, headlined by Adrenaline OD. And then the big banger. Back to the New York Hardcore Roots 50th show. 50 kids, 50 all ages free Sunday matinees we've done. With Foul Pride, Redwoods, Cropsy, Incendiary Device, it's going to jump off tonight. And Sworn Enemy, that's Sunday, July 21st. So all that's happening. Everybody okay? Yes. Orange Nine. Yep. Chaka's playing. Hey, what's happening, Larry the Hunter? Good to see you. Yes, Karen. We are looking, we are looking forward to the show with Sal. Absolutely. Yes, many great shows coming up. Um, respects to Debo. Yo, we love Debo. We love New York hardcore. And uh, that said, let's bring our guests back on. Starting with Howie Abrams. Hey, man. So lots, lots going on, bro. Lots going on. I, I feel like you just went through like months of shit, but it's all kind of happening soon. I know, man. I got to talk fast, you know? Yeah. Got You got any, anything you want to push? Well, I will say, Please. which we've, we've, we've all talked a little bit about the, uh, the Vinny Stigma book, right? So I'll give a little sneak peek. Tomorrow, I will be putting up links uh, for the pre-order for the Vinny Stigma book that's coming out. The release date, publishing date is now September 10th. And it will be available for pre-order beginning, well, it's on Amazon right now, actually. Um, but I'm going to let everybody know about it tomorrow. <laughs> it will be on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Target, like all that kind of stuff. We're going to do a big event uh, involving Generation Records when the, when the book is coming out. But it's September 10th. The book is called The Most Interesting Man in the World, which he is. And uh, September 10th. But if you want to get a jump on the pre-order... Um, it is up on Amazon, uh, as we speak, um, to, uh, to basically go get the book. And the cool thing about Amazon is they have this, like, uh, they have this pre-order guarantee. So if you buy it tomorrow for whatever price and it goes down later, you get the benefit of that difference, which is kind of cool. Um, so if they, cause they often drop the price and, uh, you know, but it's a little too early. Uh, to do that now, but and for uh, those for those see. out for those out there who may not know about Howie's um, uh, prowess as an author, he was this is book uh, number ten. This is you're right. I mean, he was involved with the HR book, with the Kohler Brothers book, you know, with the ABCs of the Grateful Dead. Yeah, Howie's how and the ABCs of Metallica. A, yeah, ABCs of Metallica. Yeah. Hey Phil. Hey Phil Rivers. What's up, man? Phil. Yeah, big Phil. Yeah, stigma book. That's right. Uh, and the AF doc. A a a abs absolutely. Yep. Uh, that said, let's uh, let's bring our guest, John Connolly, back on the show. Hey, man. Stradosia. Let me put <laughs> <laughs> let me put everyone in their in in their spot. You know, you know. Before we move on, you you know the you know I got a couple of these these kind of crazy flyers. Howie, what's and we mentioned. We mentioned AF, the nuclear and, and and peers and everything. Did this show happen, Howie? Is this the one that I know? Happen? I know it's a show this, already. This oh, this show happened. This show happened. This show happened and ended in a riot. Is that right? Yes. So this was a really great show at the Palladium, which certainly was not used to doing bands like this anymore. Anyway, they they did you know classic great metal shows early on, but. They definitely didn't do like the thrash metal hardcore stuff very much. And so this show drove the, the Palladium bouncers nuts. Ah. And so basically during Murphy's Law, you can tell that like the bouncers were really like up to here with the crowd, you know, like right. the, the chasing them around and like keeping them off the stage and the whole thing. And so there's a point in that show with Murphy's Law where Jimmy, I think, stops the show maybe more than once. And he's like, you know, 
you're watching us, we're watching you, you know, like that kind of thing. And, and you can't do this to the people who came, like no one's fighting here. Everybody's having a good time. Just throw everybody back and, you know, we're fine, you know? And so then AF plays and shit just goes down. Right. So now the bouncers are really fed up and I think they're a little terrified. Actually, the sure. end of the show is on YouTube. You can find this at Murphy's. Yeah, that's, that, that's what Pat Baldwin said. There's footage of, of this riot on YouTube. 92. And so by the end, Roger like does this whole, like, you know, like fuck these bouncers. Like if you're with us, you'll be up here on stage with us. And so the whole show basically gets on the stage. There's like Ooh. probably 200 people on stage. And basically they just, they shut the whole thing down and people were taking the monitors and throwing them down at the bouncers. Um, you see the bouncers later, like one of them has a knife out and he's like, you know, trying to ward off like kids from the show, trying to get up on stage and the whole thing. Nuclear assault set went off without a hitch, but like uh, it got, it got pretty nasty later. Wow. Alan Robert, what's up, man? Just saw you down at the bio at biohazard down in Philly. What's up, fellas? Saw nuclear salt more times than I can count at Lemoore's back in the day. Life of Agony opened up for opened up a few of them over the years. Always a great fucking band. Bought the game over vinyl at Zigzag Records in Brooklyn yeah. in yep. 86. Zigzag. Do I why do, do I have a zigzag picture? Do you remember Zigzag? Yep. Yeah, nuclear salt did an in-store there. Oh, here it is. Ah. This is see, this is what I do on planes. When I'm like <laughs> on a long plane ride, I like, I go through, well, this, I, the, the, it's not, it's not, yeah, this is about the best I could do with this. Zigzag records. <laughs> there it is. Zigzag records. God. I want to know who has the sign. Somebody, we, didn't we talk about this on a previous show? Like really? someone knew who had the sign, like the painted sign. I'm looking for the the show that limelight show flyer yeah there's a there was a limelight show that the one oh, that here didn't happen here, here it is i think this is it this is one of them right this is the is this come down dance hard at the limelight is this yeah it? yeah yeah so so that oh, combat, a combat record showcase yeah they decided to do like a like a combat show and they literally made these like fancy invitations like these cardboard like really nice like invitations, they were all over the city, and supposedly, if you had one of those, you got him for free. Oh, I have that. <clears throat> Hold on. But Keep but going. all the bands got to the limelight that night and realized because when when I got there, there was a fucking line around the corner. It was ridiculous, and right. the bands got there and found out that it was uh, it was not all ages, and so right. that right. whole that whole line was not going to get in. So. Ooh. I know that if I remembered, like John and Danny talked to Roger and Vinny and like the guys in Ludacris, and they're like, fuck it. Like, we'll just tell the club we're not playing unless they make it an all ages show. And they wouldn't make it an all ages show. So the show got canceled. So what happened was nuclear assault. There you go. That was part of the pass. And so what happened was nuclear assault and Ludacris decided to play the about 50 to 60 person capacity Lismore Lounge. There you go. In the East Village. Right. And I remember, John, you remember Jimmy Williams from Maximum Penalty, the singer? So he lived near there. We went to his house and got drums. Um, and the two bands played to whoever found out about it at the Lismore Lounge. In the basement. In the basement. That's right. Down a spiral staircase. A okay. little spiral staircase, yes. <laughs> what what a hellhole. And and here, things to do on planes number five. Boom. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. There it is. The infamous Lismore Lounge, which was like a really weird place. You go in and it was like this really nasty, like kind of like, I don't know what you call it, like a biker bar. You know, Hell's Angels used to hang out there. And then there was this spiral staircase that went down into this like dungeon, dungeon. fire trap of a basement, you know? And it was, and, oh God. And at least three of the members of Psycho Slots from Hell worked there. 
yeah. at any given right. time. Yeah. It's true. They were your, they were your bartenders. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah. That's right. There you, there you go. So, oh, and, and you know what? Since, since we're kind of doing the tour here, uh, here's a shot from Lamar that, that kind of great shot of nuclear salt and uh, Cro-Mags, right? Yeah, I took that actually. Oh, it's, it's photographer Howie Abrams. I know. It was just like one of those moments. And I must have had like some wacky, either, you know, like disposable camera or something. Because why, you know what I mean? Like I didn't bring a camera around with me and we certainly didn't have cameras on our phones. But uh, yeah, you didn't have cell phones. But that was like, it's funny because Lamour was a little late to the game with like the punk and hardcore bands, right? Yeah. And at one point, you know, it was... 85 there were a couple like they dabbled 86 there were a few but by 87 you know like basically chromags and nuclear salt are co-headlining lamore you know and and those were great shows but it's funny oh there you go that's from england that's from leeds john mm. that hell on earth show who's the guy in the zildjian shirt in the front i don't recognize from, from that band virus ah okay not New York virus, English. Yeah, yeah, virus. of course, of course. And John is absent from this photo, actually. But that show was it was like Megadeth, Nuclear Assault, Chromags, Voivod, Virus, and it was like a big Christmas show in Leeds at this big like hall. Yeah, right here. This guy just said, "Remember seeing New That's it, Christmas on at Earth. Leeds and the Christmas on Earth, a creator." Yes, creator too. Look yep, at the size creator. of those. Look at the size of those. The, the size of the beer mug Paris is holding. <laughs> that thing looks like a court, like beer mug. You know. Here's a here's a fun fact. You uh -huh. know who Nuclear Assault's road manager was at the time? Who? Abaddon from Venom. Oh wow. <laughs> hey, everybody needs a day job, right? Yeah. He, he introduced them and. He was their road manager on that whole run. Wow. That's great. Let's, um, Tony. Let's, to, yes. Uh, yeah. To you, just Tony. Yeah. He's been on the show. Yeah. Nice guy. Well, nice I was, guy. but I even want to like touch even a little further on that. Cause Please. you know, there's so many bands that we like and come from this area and whatever, and they go over to Europe and they just fucking get embraced, you know? And nuclear assault's interesting because you got embraced here too, but like the UK and Europe really like wrapped their arms around nuclear assault. Like they loved your band. And I think the UK, I think the lyrics were a big part aside from the fact that, you know, you were a great band and you were putting out really great records. But the UK, I think specifically loved the lyrical approach because they were, it's just a more political and socially aware culture. And so I, I found it interesting, like that nuclear assault just seemed to really get a ton of love over there. Like, did you feel that? I, I think that was pretty actually more so than just the UK. I think it was across Europe in general. I mean, it was, it really was. But the press in the UK, like just loved you guys. Oh, yeah, but think, again, let's go back to the, the fundamental problem with satanic lyrics. It's a very limited thing to talk about. And yeah. if you're a, a, a reviewer or a writer or what have you, uh, you've got to come up with a 1,500-word article about a band's lyrics. Right. So if you want to write a 1,500-word article about satanic lyrics or topical issues. Yeah, you definitely gave them something to, like, you know, care about. And, uh, and, and I just recall like reading, you know, the reviews and the articles about your shows and your albums in Kerrang and Metal Forces and all those magazines. And like they, they did really hit on the lyrical approach of the band, because at the time, none of your supposed peers were doing that, you know, were writing about those things. Yeah, it, it, it did set us apart. Big was, time. Was, was there any... Like, and we're, we're you know what uh, what I'm what I'm sort of steering this whole thing to is kind of this era here, and and purposely I, I I'm using the cassette, you know, <laughs> the, the the cassette shot of it because 
I feel like sort of that era cassettes were you were you know when, when you when, when you get you know when when the, uh you, you buy a cassette it was on like the, the the super high quality cassette they would try to tell you, you oh know, yeah like, it's the super you know gazoint and chrome cassette you know um was was there any any sort of um in lack of a better term john like market over there that that just really really i mean how he mentioned the uk was there any any places over there that would there's really really uh, loved you guys oh yeah germany holland england i mean we we were pretty pretty widely accepted across europe um yeah certainly even after the metal scene here pretty much died uh it's <clears throat> kept moving in europe it was still a thing in europe yeah, yeah like you were asking before about being on the slayer tour and by that time like Nuclear assault was such a factor over there that it, it also isn't like here. Like here, it feels like if you're a Slayer fan, like you almost feel like you're not supposed to like other bands or something. <laughs> like, and it's there. They just, you know, nuclear assault was like added value to a Slayer show. They were like, fuck, we get nuclear assault also. You know, it was a different attitude. And so and again, nuclear assault was quite established there for about two years already. Um, but I always loved when they would go over there and just like being able to see the photos and like come back and see Dan and John and be like, you know, look at the photos that they, they took and those kinds of things and be like, you know, again, like the little league dad vibes, like, you know, our boys are fucking doing it, you know, That's exciting, and, man. That's exciting. And, and it really was. And it was just like, you know, the, the, the sort of, again, like one of the big things about nuclear assault was sort of the attitude of the guys, specifically John and Dan, that would go there. And like, it was a hardcore attitude. It was a very like, let's hang out with everybody and like drink beer with everybody. And it's not, you know, the like us up here and you down there. And and that went a long way, I think, just for the band in general, because even the supposed like, you know, we don't have an image thrash metal bands of the era, very, there was a lot of rock starry shit going on, you know? And, and and John and Dan never had that. I mean, that was why they got accepted at CB's matinees playing with their band because people were like, oh, I know those guys. They're here all the time. And so it wasn't like this foreigner thing coming in here and like infiltrating our little thing, you know? So, Howie, were you? I like, I like hanging out after the show at the bar with the, with the metalheads. Yeah. Right, right. And you did. Yeah. So How we was this? So were you at in effect? Uh, uh, listen, it's a it's a it's a dumb question. You know what? <laughs> I, and, and, and I'm and I'm and I'm going to answer it with with a photo because I was going to say, were you at in effect when <laughs> you know they did that record? Well, obviously you were because here's a picture of the three of us oh, uh, yeah, doing yeah. doing the video for Trail of Tears off that record. Howie's on the left. I'm next to him and Paris Mayhew and Danny and and Drew, you know, that that outfit is still the best. You know what I was, this is the first music video Paris and I That's right. did together. It was 19, this is 88, right? And this was 80, my mind 89, was, 89. I'm the producer and my dad always said, you, you gotta over, you gotta over, you gotta dress for the role. You gotta, <laughs> you know, you gotta, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm the producer, I'm gonna wear an outfit. You dress know? for the job you want. Dress, you know, and, and listen, <laughs> Nice vision shirt. So it's not, it's not, it's actually a sweatshirt, right, Howie? So, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. But, but before we get to the, 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 the Trail of Tears video, what, what can you give us, John, a little, a little kind of perspective on, on, uh, Handle with Care, uh, recording it and anything that you remember that, that, that resonates all these years later? Oh, uh, well, this is, uh, done at Grinder Studios in Los Angeles with uh, Randy and Casey, the producer and engineer. Um, by this time, you know, they knew us, they knew the sound that we were looking for. Uh, Glenn was heavily involved in putting together the drum sounds. Uh, we just had a lot more experience in the studio with the <coughs> production and the things. Um, it was fun, it was always, Grinder was a great place to record. I don't know if they're still open. Yeah, a lot of studios closed. Was it was it one of those deals where like we're sh we're, we're shipping you out there where there's no distractions and and where you can really focus up on it and do, do you do you feel 
uh, in retrospect, do you feel like this 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 uh, record has aged well, John? I think, I think it's done pretty well, honestly. Um, again, you're looking at an album where two or three of the songs were written within a week or ten days of going into the studio to record them. Uh, that that's just seemed to be what our mo was. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you guys recorded relatively quickly, I think. You know, relative to like other bands who I think got like nutty about, you know, things in the studio. But you guys also, like you were just saying, like you were probably more well versed in how to go about what you wanted to do. Um, but I don't remember you guys ever really taking particularly long to do an album. I think that one was a month from start to finish. Yeah. Which and at the time was like a third of what other people did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, mean, I mean, Metallica did an album and they spent more time on the drum tracks than we spent on the entire album. An album, yeah. But then you go back to a band like E-Trope, they did their first album on a budget of $6,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that album sounds great. Love did you do, Did you do that record uh, sequentially? Did you like record it, mix it all, all, all in, in, in like one sitting? How do you mean? Well, be, be, well I, I guess, I guess um, I'm just thinking about, uh, I'm just working on a, uh, a documentary with the band and they're talking about how they recorded the record and then went on the road and then they heard mixes after and da 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 da. When you were out there on that record, did you record it and then sit the, you know, like, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of times it's, hey, let's let it air out a month, let's listen to it. And then sometimes you don't have that luxury. You just have to record it and get right in there and fucking mix it. Yeah, know? no, that's a, yeah, it was, so it was recording the tracks, mixing the tracks and mastering the tracks. It was yeah. all done in one swoop. In retrospect, we probably should have taken some time between recording and mixing. Yeah. Definitely. Although that record sounds pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah. I like I've, I've got issues with all of our records. Yeah, well, musicians always do, right? Yeah, that's, of course. The, that's the spirit. Yeah. Um, somebody asked me once, what's your favorite nuclear assault album? I said the next one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you, know, you gotta do better. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. People people love this record, man. I mean, this is a beloved, this is a this is a beloved, uh, a beloved record. Uh, what was the what was the feeling it, uh, over there at the label, Howie? Uh, you know about yeah. I mean, it's funny because this was like the return to the Relativity family, right? Yeah. And after the IRS record, and the good news is that really, you know, good things happened uh, on that IRS record. The band had become quite a bit more popular. Uh, it was a good sounding record, generally speaking. Great songs. They got video play. Like people, you know. The, the, the popularity of the band had grown quite a bit um, since before the Survive album. And so, you know, we were like, look, you know, for me personally, and, and I had in effect by that time, you know, right. I, I basically went up to the powers that be. I was like, you'd be fucking special needs if you didn't give me this album, you know, and let right, me work right. on this and right. like market it and help. And so... You know, basically they said, of course, and we did it and it fit in with the other things we were doing, you know, with within effect. And by that point, you know, and, you know, we were like ready for it. We were looking forward to it. We were psyched about it. And, you know, ultimately they delivered, you know, what's still an incredible to me, you know, album that that does live on very well. And, uh, and, you know, we just got behind it and worked really hard and the band toured and, you know, they were around. And it, it even, it even charted a bit, didn't it? Yeah. I don't know what the chart number was, but it was like, I don't know if survive must've charted as well, but like, you know, uh, it, it was something that, you know, people were like, Oh, nuclear assault's one of those bands now, you know, like they're, yep. they're in the mix with those bigger thrash metal bands, you know? And then we did two videos and, and here's here's one of them here. Let me let me play a clip. Let me play a clip of this one. And it just so happens I randomly scrolled to the middle of the video where where I have a cameo as a drug dealer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and there's and there's my godfather, uh, Gabe Dirienzo. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, it's my godfather. Uh, you know who 
Yeah. <laughs> I thought Jews don't have godfathers. Well, you know, this one does. <laughs> um, and this is on the roof. This this is actually this is this is interesting. This is on the roof. Uh, so I was the stage manager. I was the stage manager at 3G Stage in New York City. It's where we did. You know, later on we did Biohazard Punishment in there and Typo Negative Black Number One. But across the street was a warehouse where they held movie sets, and we got we we got them to let us use it as a location. And that's that's where we shot this. And this this here is on is on the roof. This is on on the roof. This this great kind of you know breakdown. Great stuff. A you know what's, what's what's great about the steady cam thing that Paris had is mm -hmm. it just makes everything look expensive. Yeah, of course, man. These are the these are, these are the these are the tricks that that we use. And this was the first video that Paris and I uh, did together. And 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 I have to thank you, Howie. You know. And and you, John, you know, this really this really set us uh, on our way in, in, in a lot of uh, in a lot of regards. You know, it, it was really, really great. And then there's a shot. I want to sort of call everybody's attention. There, there's this great shot in the. Yeah. Wait, where is it? In the elevator. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's this this great shot we did, you know, in the freight elevator going up and, and going down, you know. Yeah. Good stuff. Wasn't that the warehouse where they stored the props for uh, yeah. Days of Our Lives? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Oh, we're yep. in so soap opera storehouse. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's what it was. It, it, it was a they, – they, and you know what they turned that building into? It's a high school now. And, uh, and here's another shot. Now, this is a shot I never had. I, I think it might have came from you, Howie. I, I haven't saw this. So this would turned up like a couple years ago. Yeah, someone posted this on Facebook from the same day, and right. I hadn't seen it either. But it, you know, like I don't know if I sent it to you because I had seen it there, or someone else in Paris maybe sent it to you. I don't remember. Yeah, that's a good. I was. I'm always so thrilled when something like that turns up. You know, because everything it feels like history is so finite. You know, and then somebody <laughs> will do an archaeological, and something will turn up, and you'll be like, oh my god, you know. Who would have Where'd that come from? Yeah, that, that's great. Um, was was doing music videos in that era? Was that like a necessary evil, John? Did you enjoy them? Yeah, like everything else at the time, it was new. Uh, MTV yeah. was still playing music videos um, <laughs> instead of all the crazy shows that they do now. Uh, that was, I think, that was around the time when they started doing uh, Headbangers Ball. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, when it, the nice thing about MTV when they first started was that you didn't know what they were going to play next. You know, you'd be watching a Madonna video and then a heavy metal video would come on or something yeah. by ACDC. It was just a very eclectic mix of stuff. Uh, later on, they started to get a lot more formulaic in how they presented things. And yeah. like metal got its own show. Uh, I think like the hard rock stuff got its own show and everything the else. Alternative <laughs> stuff got its own yeah. show, right? Yeah, yeah. 120 no. minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, to me, that made it less interesting instead of more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But Headbangers Ball took a, a serious liking to Nuclear Assault. And, like, I forget her name. I always forget her name. And she was great. Like, she was the, the uh, like, the producer of Headbangers Ball. So oh, she was, I know you're, you're talking about. Um, she was the woman you had to bring the videos to. Yeah, yeah. And, and she loved Nuclear Assault. Like, she was a fan. She was also a big fan of Biohazard later, and so like when is we she the, is she the one that kind of had a soft spot for Dominic DeLuca and and had him out doing the man on the street shit. No, I'm, well maybe 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 right. I, I shouldn't say no. No 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 no. We're not talking uh, Dogtown sixteen. Of, you know, we're not talking about no. Vanessa that's Warwick. England. That's Vanessa England. Warwick was England, and she was a VJ, right? Yeah. So no, we're not. We're talking about a programmer. You know? Yeah, so she, I forget her name. Of course, when the show's over, I'm going to remember it. But yeah. like, we brought, you know, uh, the the first video uh, to to Headbangers Ball. You bring it right to her, right. and it, she was already like in. You know, like if the video was John farting in a bag, <laughs> like they were going to play it. You know, but it just so happened that we handed them two really good videos, but like, um, but she was in, you know, like, like yeah. we're going to play this. And, and you guys, I think did you and Dan, I think, or Dan and um, Glenn maybe were on the show. I don't remember. Like they, you guys did an interview on, on headbangers ball. And then, yep. 
you know, all of that. So, and at that time, nuclear assault was worldwide enough that there was Headbangers Ball in the UK and, and things right. like that. And they played it there too. Um, I don't even think Vanessa Warwick was at MTV yet. It seems way too early. Well, yeah. It's funny, that breakdown clip, um, I was at a, I don't even know what kind of event it was. I, I'm going to assume it was a music event, but I think it was Channel 4 News was there. Oh. Uh, and uh, the, the presenter, you know, I, I, I don't know how I struck up a conversation with her, but uh, there was a dominatrix spanking a, some guy. And I said, no, I'd really love to get an, a, an interview with her. I was like, oh. I'll go talk to her. What you you can do that? It's like yeah, you know, I know the woman, but uh, I just approached her. I said hi, my name is John. I'm a musician. The news crew would like to do an interview with you. Are you interested? And so, oh yeah, sure. So, so the, the woman was just astounded that I had the the nerve to walk up to a dominatrix <laughs> and yeah, ask her for an interview slot. That's funny. Oh, well, once so you break, what, what, do you, what do you call that? That you break the third, once what? you break the the, the, like the an icebreaker. Plane. Yeah, hey, 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 wow, how you doing? <laughs> hey, you want a job as a production assistant? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, kind of moving 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 things along here and uh you know, uh, thoughts on out of order. Now this was this is sort of uh, back back to IRS, right? And 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 Danny Danny was out, you had a second guitar player, is is that right? Yeah, so all sorts of strange stuff was happening with that album. Uh we were in Japan, and we got into a huge fight over who, who was writing what. And again, I never stopped writing. You know, I, I don't, we're in the studio recording an album, and I'm you know, between takes writing music for the next album. And uh, again, I was always the guy that was pulling songs out of the hat when we were going in. We needed two or three more tunes. A uh, couple of the guys took, a, took it into their heads that... Uh, I was hogging the writing credits. And meanwhile, I'm the guy begging people to write. I'm the guy begging people to sit down and you know give me give me an assist because again, I I was at the point where it was very stressful to me. Uh, oh, we you got to come up with a couple more songs. I said, why why is it always me? You know. So we got into this big fight in Japan, and I basically told the rest of the band, "Fine, you guys take the next album. I'll sit out completely. You, you write the music, you write the lyrics, you write the melodies. I'll just come in and record my parts." Uh, so a lot of people over the years point out that uh, you know this this album has a very different feel to it from our other records, and this is a big part of it. And it, the joke is, when we, was, we were scheduled to go in, the guys were still th like a th three or four songs short, and I ended up you know contributing songs that I'd been working on to the album. Uh, so it wasn't a very enjoyable experience as a record. Uh, we ended up doing some of these songs live, but they slowly got weeded out of the mix for whatever reason. Mm. Uh, and again, to, uh, this is something I don't understand with this group. You know, bands that release an album play songs off that latest album. Mm -hmm. You know, and you retire some of your older catalog. Uh, we kind of did things in the opposite direction. We work in a, a one or two new songs off the new album, but then they would slowly get dropped out in favor of the older catalog stuff. It's like, oh, it's kind of the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing, but okay. Was it similar with uh, something wicked as well? Well, okay, the lineup change. Yeah. Uh, initially, I asked for that. I, I asked to just be a singer because um, again, I, I was on stage. I was running around like a maniac, you know, and I, I was just—I thought I needed a break. It was a poor decision at the time, and looking back, I can see that okay, that was a bad call on my part. But uh, we bought in Dave DiPietro, and when uh, Danny took me aside and said, look, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm into heavier stuff. I'm tired of doing this stuff. So that's when we bought in Scott Metaxas. Both of those guys had worked together, uh, both phenomenal musicians. Dave's not just a great guitarist. He's also a brilliant stage performer. I mean, I remember times of just stopping and looking at what he was doing on stage. <laughs> like, oh, my God, how does how? Um, Scott was uh, very astute in the studio, really good at uh, the studio end of things. Um, at, that's about the time that uh, Anthony was asked to leave mm -hmm. because we were killing ourselves at Glenn's house writing this album. And we're, we're looking out like, where, where's Anthony? What's going on? And uh, I think, I want to say Glenn called him and Anthony just basically said something to the effect of, uh, yeah, you guys do it without me. And at that point, Right about that time, Scott and uh, Dave saw 
video of me live on stage with a guitar and they were like oh no we're not losing that right because that's that's like no you know so uh when we moved forward it was just the four of us so danny walked voluntarily anthony was kind of asked to leave got it got it makes, makes sense and did you guys soon after that did you guys uh, take a break for a while I don't think we had a choice about taking a break. This is, yeah. you, know, you gotta, you remember how you, were, you guys sure. were there at the time. Set the table for us. When Seattle Sound came out. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. That pretty much killed the metal scene in this country. Like you said earlier, if, uh, in this country, some of the culture is almost, if you like one band, you're not supposed to like others. Right. And right. then when uh, Seattle Sound came out, all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, we're going to do this now. And yeah, forget, forget thrash metal. We're done with that. And the, the scene basically collapsed on itself. Yeah. At least right. that's what I felt living through that period of time. And yeah, even, it, was a tough, it was a tough time, right, Howie? Well, Scott, yeah, Scott was, and I it, were listening to one of these groups, and it's like, we're both looking at each other. It's like, the singer's off key. Yeah. You know, how did this get out of the studio? Who th and this is being played in rotation on MTV. Well, but the thing was that that what what what's weird about that time. Uh, there's a lot of weird things about that time, but like it killed you know hair metal, which is a whole other thing because hair metal was like the mainstream MTV thing and like really killed that. And then, but what it did is it made as you heard some of these bands talk and do interviews and like Kurt Cobain and Dave Grohl, obviously it made people pay attention to punk, right? It's like, it, it made people go, who is this Bad Brains band? You know, because they were also heavily influenced by wow. bands like Bad Brains and the DC scene and uh, you're hearing about Ian MacKay and like all this stuff because of like grunge, which was weird. Not so much like Soundgarden or Alice in Chains, but like some of these other bands, like you were, you know, especially Nirvana, you know, were like giving tribute to like all these old punk and hardcore band. So that was like an interesting time that way. And then, you know, not that long after you had like this, like the green days and the, you know, the offsprings and all those kinds of bands started to get really big. And then, you know, ska punk had its moment and all these things started happening. So it's just weird how that shit goes. And it usually it comes full circle, but it actually feels like that process has hit a wall now, you know, where yeah, of course, like, like the sound, the various sounds coming back around like 10 years later. And like, you're not even seeing that quite as much. It's like sort of all pop or all really underground. I, I also think for, for, you know, everybody that's sort of, um, you know, rags about the old, uh, you know, record company system, at least there was a system and there was an infrastructure and, yeah. there, the, you know, something did exist, you know, you, that, that did exist for better, for better or worse. You know, and, and 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 now it's just it's a very the, top, the topography is just very different, and that's okay too. Things change. You know, this is this is the, you know this is life's the world we live in. But you know, things things music is just is 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 a very different animal these days. Yeah, and the media is different, and all these things are different. Like the fact that mainstream it, in the mainstream world on like a CNN or something, you'll hear them say emo, yeah. and you're like, what? Like that was like a sound that came from Discord Records in DC for a while, you know. Like it's like, all it's 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 all been absorbed into like not just the American but the worldwide like lexicon. You know, it's you hear, bizarre. Slam dancing now. Well, mosh, the mosh, whole mosh concept, mosh. right? Like my grandma was moshing. Yeah, it's like really was she? Um, you know, and arguably that may have like come out of Vinnie Stigma's mouth for the first time. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, a long time ago, I just decided I just just decided to just take it and just enjoy the 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 the, the dichotomy of, of of life and all this this kind of stuff. I nothing's bizarre. To, nothing's bizarre to me anymore. No, you know, not in, anymore. In, in this in me in art and music in the world we live in, nothing, nothing. You know what I forgot to ask? Not that this is a real segue, but like we didn't talk about John Connolly's theory um, that that you actually did a solo album. Yes, I did. Um, it was kind of a kind of a brand of metal with a little more progressive stuff thrown in. Uh, 
experiment with weird time signatures. Some of it that, you know, looking back, some of it's really well done. Some of it, man, not so much. Uh, yeah, we recorded that in Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah, Warren. Yeah, Warren. Oh, you did it at the at the, at the infamous Normandy Tom Shores, Island? baby. Yeah, that was where uh, Scatterbrain did the record, I believe. Spies, Were you involved with that, Howie? Were you involved with that record? Yeah, I was still. They were still in an effect when we did that, and then Glenn did a, a weird solo album called CIA. Um, but John went up there, and and you know when when you're the singer of a, a band that people know, like your solo album tends to like get some attention. And he went up and and did it with Tom Sores, like his. It, it was that era where people were going up and you know working with Tom. Like Tom was kind of the guy at the moment. Yeah. Well, we also had Casey McMacken in the studio. Right, right. Right, you had Casey too. Yep. Now, that was right around the time, I believe, that uh, wasn't in effect, wasn't the important records bought out at that point? Well, so yeah, so about 90, 91, around in there, that's when Sony basically bought the place. Yeah. Um, right. Now, I remember know. the first pressing of uh, the Theory album sold out, like, almost immediately. Yeah. Because then they were very like low expectations. It's a project. It's not really a band, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so the album came out, but you you were John from Nuclear Assault and people cared. Right. But that's right when that first person sold out. Uh, that's when the reorganization happened. It was over. <laughs> and it was, everything was everything was done. The party was over. I got canned. Yep. Is, is, that, is that what happened, Howie? Like uh, Sony buys it and Sony comes in and goes, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, yes. And then just. Yeah. Any, well, anybody who has do does anything on the creative side is gone because uh -huh. we're going to use the Sony people now. Oh, right. And they, yep. dro they dropped almost everything. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, got yeah. rid of most of the bands. And, you know, they had just signed COC who went like Southern Rock at that point and sort of kept them and maybe like a couple of earache bands and that was it all right so with the uh the theory the band yeah okay we were all friends living in uh connecticut connecticut right and we tried to keep the thing going but it's hard to support an album that nobody can buy yeah 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 That's so right. that just fractured and broke up as people went their different ways and about a year and a, a year, a year and a half later, something crazy like that, I get a phone call. Hi, it's whatever my name is from Sony Records. I <laughs> about the, the John Conley theory. It's like with the band that broke up because it sold out the first pressing. There was never a reorder, and you guys just ignored us. For, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, 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 Stefan asks, is that on iTunes? Is that is that music still out? Is that music out there at all? I have no idea. Wow. I, I would guess no. Yeah. I would guess no also, yeah. Um, well, look, in, in Sony's defense, when they bought IRD, they bought a very, very large catalog of music. Massive. And yeah. now you got to have people at Sony going through this, these different catalog pieces, sure. albums mm -hmm. and trying to figure out, okay, where does this fit into our scheme of things? Where does this fit? Well, no. the, plus they didn't know the story. They just saw numbers. Yeah. Like yeah. if you think anyone at Sony knew that you were a nuclear assault, not a chance. Yeah. Right. Zero, like zero chance. And this and, is a and this is a common tale, right, Howie? I mean, this 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 is you could go through the line with a bunch of different labels, even fairly recently, whether yeah. it's Victory or Century Media, whatever or, it is, yeah. you know. But also, like to Sony, like there's no difference to them between John's record and Glenn's record. It's two right. guys who did these who were in these bands that they didn't know anything about. Sure. And and John's did substantially better than Glenn's because mm -hmm. nobody knows the drummer. And like, <laughs> it's always that case. <laughs> and, you know, so, out, hangs out with musicians. Yeah. So to them, it's the same thing. But somebody here, Chris Hoffman, just brought up a good point, which was, and I, I'll bring up the fact that John went on the road with 24 7 Spies, which was also, mm -hmm. you know, on in effect and was basically like teching for Jimmy Hazel which led to a song on the second Spies album called John Connolly Theory. That's right. That's right. Which is heavy as fuck. Yeah, Jimmy, I hope you're still watching. He said that I should tell you that he loves you. <laughs> Teching for Jimmy Hazel. Man, that's... <laughs> Actually, for the whole band. I was, just, I was the sole tech, if I remember correctly. We had a sound guy and me. 
But, and this uh, is and this is this is when um, Peter was in the band. I'm assuming, right? Yep. They were four four piece. Yeah. 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 Uh, in that tour, we were uh, Spies was headlining with Primus opening. Right. Oh wow. Yeah. And, uh, then Primus's guitar tech hurt, got got himself hurt. I think he broke an arm or a leg. I don't remember which. And they ended up asking me to do their tech work for the rest of the tour. Yeah. But uh, one day I'm. Oh, here he is. Cool. He's. Hey. he's He's still watching. All right, Jimmy. <laughs> love you. Love you. So they they asked me to sound check his guitar, and I started playing a riff that I was working on like an idiot. And all of a sudden, their eyes, their heads snap towards me, and their eyes light up. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't think I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so they ended up incorporating that riff into one of their songs. Yeah. 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 There the, you go. The album opener. Yeah. yeah. Um, this just in. Um, the solo album uh, theory, back to basics album, is full on YouTube, which oh, makes wow. sense. A fan that, that, that that's usually the case, right? It's not on Spotify legit, but right. somebody who loves the band or loves the music can put it up on on, on YouTube, and yes. you, you found you find a lot of stuff. You know, you find a lot of stuff on YouTube that just is not on Spotify. You know, legit. It's, it's usually, kind of amazing, you know, actually. Yeah. Okay. It, it, I, yeah. Guys, I'm a half step removed from a caveman when it comes to tech stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, so right. be gentle. Um, okay. You know what? We're going to take a quick break. But before, here's a question. I have Survive on hard copy, but will we ever see it on Spotify? Brainwashed Vid was great, too. Um, how you might be more apt to answer this. Yeah, I mean, that was on Survive. Um, but... I have to say, I, I couldn't even tell you who owns that album now. Yeah, you know it's, I mean? one of those, it's like one of those things. Like, I don't remember who the distribution was for the IRS stuff. Um, I think the, Century Media, Media picked up Survivor. Oh, may have picked it up later. So then I wonder if it's not on Spotify, it should be. It, I mean, and just before <clears throat> we take this break, Howie, this, this is something uh, you and I have talked about this a lot. And, and, and this happens quite a bit is like, a lot of the label gets bought out or picked out and like a lot of music really just sort of disappears. Like, yeah. It disappears. It's not a shelf. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. And then you can never figure out who all like, like even like the profile record stuff yeah, or yeah, yeah. like wow. who, who like really owns it. And well, that's nobody, thing. nobody seems to know. No, because a company buys a company buys a company and nobody right. really takes responsibility for, you know, like the product and like and the people who are involved at that level don't give a shit about music. Of and course. so there's no consideration for the fact that, you know, there might be fans who want this and whatever. And and the point being, you're you're at a, a period now where you could put anything out on vinyl and people clamor for it, especially if like they cared about it at one point yeah. to begin with. And it just seems like a mess, like it just sitting there. Like, so either be gracious and give it back to the artist and let them just have it and control it um, or put it out. But again, you, you're dealing with these <clears throat> companies buying up huge swaths of catalog. I mean, yeah, it, th yeah. things take time. I, yeah. I, I can't believe I'm defending a record company here, but, <laughs> well, but they also <laughs> they, they, on they, you. they have yeah. to be inclined to do it also. You know, they have to like. Yeah. Think right. that way, and do but like, like with with IRD, you know that they were going to prioritize Le Miserable, right? Yeah, how could like, they not? Yeah, yeah, of I mean, course. What 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 did that do for us? Like, one and a half million, two and a half million copies. Yeah, and it kept the lights on in the building, and like yeah. allowed them to sign your band. Yeah. yeah. So if they're buying up IRD, then you know that that's going to be a top priority for them. Sure. You know, that yeah. black you know Black Flag was a big priority. That all those uh emo and goth bands that I've never heard of before or since. Right. Because that was hot at the moment. But right. you know, if, right. I'm, um, if I'm a product manager and I, I look at, for example, the Theory album, it's like, okay, it sold 15,000 units. Okay, so what? That's nothing. Right. But there's not well, that's that, the thing, right? There's a disconnect. Yeah. It's like it only sold 15,000 because that's all that was pressed. Right, because it was out for seven minutes. But like, you know, but that's the whole, that's the whole point. Like they don't know about... No that stuff they just know about fifteen thousand units compared to some you know this nuclear assault band that sold you know in six figures you know and so they don't know like they have no idea they just see the number and they're like well why would we bother they don't know the story behind it and they certainly didn't ask anybody either 
No. Hey, what wasn't surfing? What wasn't surfing with the alien on the label too? Well, that was the huge album. That's wasn't like it, what right? really, like that blew up. Like massive. Was, was, was that was it? Was it was that record projected to do it on that label, or was that just like, hey, we we sort of love this guy, let's sign him, and then well, it just. There was a previous album that did okay, you know. So there was a. Uh, I forget what the name of that. Yeah, I remember. It's just, I think it's just called Joe Satriani. I something, think. you know. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had a bit of a history. Yeah. He was a big yeah. deal, you know. And so, but what happened was he made an album that was actually able to get on rock radio. Yep. And so nobody thought it was going to be as big as it wound up. Yeah. But like, Great you record. know, they had like a real like hot uh, shot. Not of this earth. was Not, not of this earth, earth, right. Yeah. That That's, was it. Thank you, Paulie. Thank you. And I think the one after it was called like flying in a blue moon or something like yeah. that. And so, you know, basically I love that record. they had like a young hotshot radio guy who went on to like work at major labels and did radio mm -hmm. promotion. Um, and he like took it on as like a mission, you know, to like, I'm going to, I'm going to prove something here and yeah. I'm going to try to get like one of these songs on the radio. And he wound up getting it on like the same rock stations that were playing fucking U2 and, you know, all this other stuff. And like, yeah. it just worked. And it's one of those total step and shit, get lucky, you know, but work hard moments. And it worked. Yeah, you know, but if you, back, go ahead, if you listen to Joe's music, okay, that guy's a kick-ass writer. A hundred percent. I mean, the IRS put out a series of albums called Guitar Speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, when these... Copeland's assistant played it for me. He gave me a copy, and the next day or two later, he's like, so what did you think? I was like, honestly, I thought it was boring. Right. Because it was basically just hard rock type songs with no lyrics. Yeah. Sure. And following that same one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, 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 two arrangement. Sure. But without, it's like listening to any random pop rock song with no with the vocals taken right. out. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this, not writing, this, that's not writing this an was structured melodically to be like, there were guitar parts that were choruses and like those types of things. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Satriani is approaching it as almost like playing the instrument, like it's part of an orchestra. Right. And I, I love flying in a uh, flying in a blue moon. You know, he actually, he actually did some vocals on that record. Big yeah. bad, big bag, big bad moon and stuff like that. And you got some play on MTV with that video. And wasn't uh, he like, uh, he was like Kirk Hammett's uh, an early guitar yeah. teacher yeah. of his. And yeah. like, and, and, and Vi, I think Vi took lessons from him, too, I think. Well, so then after the success of Satriani, they signed Steve yeah. Vi. And Steve you know, Vi had, had a very big record. Not, not to, and I know we're, we're, we're going to take a break in a second, but I like, I, I like Vi. I love Satriani. And I saw Satriani play at the bottom line here in New York. Yes. Uh, you know, at, 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 at that moment blew my mind. I was, was, that, was that the show where, like, uh, Mick Jagger came out? Yeah. Right. It was great. Right. But, but I was just, I was so close and God, he was such an exciting player at that time. You know, he, I, he really, I just loved his, you know, I loved his freaking playing, man. You know, anyway, yeah. uh, that said, let me, let me take quick sponsor break and let's take some questions from around the world. John, can you do another 15 minutes with us? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll, I'll, see, you, I'll see, see you in a second. Yeah, go ahead. How are you? I'll see you in a minute. Well, there you have it. This is the one, the only, often imitated, never duplicated, the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And we are sponsored by blah, 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 and the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. The client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Relay, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages and, of course, www.texassilverrush.com. Come on now, last but not least, Mad Vintage buys, sells, and collects band shirts, primarily hardcore. The DIY operation was started and is operated by a hardcore kid who just loves collecting and eventually got into vintage clothing, specifically the realm of vintage band shirts. They are always looking to buy out collections to either keep, sell, or trade new shirts added daily at www.madvintage.com and post it on Instagram. Dig deep into that closet of crap and reach out to them. Make some money for yourself. Mad Vintage. That said, 
Hey, uh, just a couple reminders. Um, and in the meantime, please post your post your questions for our guests, for John Connolly from Nuclear Salt or Howie Abrams or myself. Now's the time to post. Go deep. Get weird. Uh, just want to re remind everybody, please follow the show and myself on Instagram. I'm sure you have a communication device. If you're watching for the first time, pick it up at Stone Films NYC. Also, uh, if you want, like the show. I'm told that's a good thing. Uh, do a thumbs up on the show. And uh, subscribe if you're watching it in rerun on YouTube. Right there, there's a button. Please subscribe to the channel, Stone Films NYC. Also, just want to remind everyone, I am very accessible. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, that said, once again, um, there's a super chat function, which, uh, which has uh, come up a couple times already. Uh, super chat function. Please uh, use it. Uh, it's a great way to donate a couple bucks to the show, and that's what keeps the show going. Let's be frank. Um, your, your support. Happy birthday, Lee Farley from New York Hardcore Comics. I love you, bro. You're the first uh, show sponsor the show had. Uh, goddamn God bless. Goddamn electric. Uh, that said, um, post your questions. Uh, just a reminder. Or, and by the way, if anyone's going to be out uh, at Dingbat's 10, I'm going to see my old friend Doyle play. Me and Michael Lago and my significant other, Rochelle, are going out to see uh, Doyle play tonight, so I'm looking forward to seeing my old friend. Um, that said, um, post your questions. Um, I will see, just a reminder, um, I'm up in Boston. Uh, not Boston, it's actually um, Beverly at Bridge Nine uh, this Saturday. And then, of course, come on now, get your ass down to the free all-ages matinee one week from today. 48th show we're doing with Fahrenheit 451, Kings Never Die, Brick by Brick, Albany Represent, Mike Valente in the house, the Car Bomb Parade, and Faded Line. And then, of course, we will be back here a week from Wednesday with the new music show. That said, let's bring on Howie Abrams. Hey, man. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? <laughs> Funny seeing you um, here. Yeah. Um, and let's bring on John Conley. Hey, hey. hey, I saw a question there that I was going to talk about too, but like, if, if you, if you can, uh, which one and I'll post it up. It was about, uh, him being a teacher. Oh, good. Um, um let's see. Oh, here it is. Uh, count asks, let's hear about how John became a school teacher. What grade and subject does he teach? Oh, okay. Uh, when I proposed to my wife, my, my, my girlfriend, then fiance, now wife, uh, she said she wanted to have kids. And my response was, I, I got to get a better job. So, uh, yeah, when it went, went to college for the first time at the, around age 40 or 40. Yeah, 40. Uh, got a four-year degree in two and a half years and got a job teaching social studies for the Department of Education in high school. You overachiever, you. Hey, she wanted two kids. She wanted one each. We got it all out of the way at once with twins. What happens when you get overachievers together? Wow. Very nice. Very nice. Um, I assume, John, you you have a you know uh, you have a love for teaching young people. It's uh, wearing thin these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I used to think that if I hit the lottery tomorrow, I would still go to work. Right. I'm starting to not think that as much anymore. This is it's over, Johnny. Yeah. It's becoming a, a, um, a difficult environment to work in. Uh, Sean McNally asks, and, and some of these are a little obvious, but let's let's air a couple out. Uh, Sean McNally up in Boston says, John, is Nuclear Salt still a working touring entity? If so, who do I contact about a Boston show? Another great episode, Drew and Howie. Uh, no, nope, Nuclear Salt is defunct now. Yeah. And I, I don't see us coming back. Yeah. Fair enough. Which which, which uh, makes me feel like I really accomplished something when I got you guys to come out of retirement for oh, my yeah, I got that birthday flyer. party, you know, which I was like, this is such a long shot. Like when I reached out, I was like, I, I don't think they're going to do this. You know, I can't see how that happens. Here it is. And, and there it was. Yeah, there you go. And, and yeah. Drew, you played that show as well. 
I played this show as well with the uh, the Drew Stone Hit Squad uh, acoustic. Yep. We 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 opened up the show. We were on the same bill, John. Yes, we were. That's very cool. Yeah, and you know this was at St. Vitus, which I don't think St. Vitus has reopened, right? Has not not yet reopened. They're uh, they're they're promoting shows at other venues, but the yeah. actual St. Vitus room is still shuttered. Mm. I wonder if they're going to be able to to make that happen, huh? I hope so because I feel like they got really screwed. Like someone just had it out for them and did this. They kind of did. They got screwed, man. Yep. Um, Oh, you know what? Here, here, I have a tie-in for this one. Okay, wait. First, I have a photo. This is from Stephen Messina, mm -hmm. uh, our very own Stephen Messina Hart. So here's the photo, and then I have the question to go with it. Here's the photo, and then <laughs> and here's the and here's the question. You ready? My first two nuclear assault shows were at Sundance in Bayshore, which is where this photo was taken, uh, and I believe it, it's from 89. 89. Uh, any memories of Sundance, John? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the place was a kind of a pain in the ass to headline at because <laughs> you didn't go on until like some ridiculous late hour at night. So while you're loading your equipment out into the truck, the sun's coming up. So you're always exhausted the day after. <laughs> Sundance. Yeah, that was Frank Cariola, right? Frank Cariola. Yeah, at one point it was called Frank Cariola's Sundance. And here's another one that that uh, that Stephen sent me of Danny from that same show. There he is. Come on. Boom. Come on now. There he is. Look at the bot. Look at the bot on that kid, huh? He's still, he's still exactly the same. He always had the abs. Always. Yeah. There's not enough body fat on that man to grease a skillet. No, that's for sure. Always irritated the crap out of me because he eats. The, like the, at the time, he was eating the crappiest food on the planet. Never gained any weight, and I'm working out like a maniac because I have a tendency <laughs> to put on weight. My, Meister Brown and Cam Sun Kitchen, and, oh. do, and doobies, yeah. and doobies. <laughs> Here's, you know what? I, I'm just kind of picking through some of the photos that didn't go up. This is an interesting shot of Danny. Excuse me, <clears throat> playing a Rickham, playing the Rickenbacker. That's yeah. early, yeah. You know? Wow. Great bases. Yeah. Yeah. Playing playing the Rick. It, with the D, with the DRI sticker on the Rick. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's early. That's like uh that's probably CB's eighty six around that those two eighty six C B shows. Yeah. There, there, there you go. And and you know, and while we're just sort of bouncing the ball back and forth, just a couple of things here. You know, we didn't put this one up. What's going on here? Yeah, that was a weird show. What Not everybody this? played that show. What's that? Not everybody played that show, if I recall. What a like what kind of crazy bill is this? It's some oh, oh, it's a new music, music seminar, seminar show. show. Yeah. Oh. Celtic Frost, DOA, NDC, Sam Hain, Nuclear Assault, Rogue Male, and the Cheetah Crow motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the show where uh somehow Tom uh, Tom Gabriel didn't have a guitar strap. Uh -huh. I ended up loaning him one of mine. And for like the next two or three years, we were just swapping it back and forth between each other. Oh, he's a guitar strap. Oh, you need this guy. Funny. That's great. Let's see. What else? One of the weirdest uh, bills ever. Uh, Winsome Lusome asks, any standout memories from John on the Acid Rain uh, Nuclear Assault European Tour? Yeah, we had a blast. Every, yeah, it was... <laughs> Look, I, I love being on the road. I love the whole living in a tour bus, showering in the venue, you know, the whole, you know, being in a different city every day. We got, yeah, Asher and, and we just got along famously. Everybody had pretty much on the same page as far as uh, we're here to have fun. We're here to do good shows. We're here to make sure the audience is getting two good you know, sets from two different bands tonight. Um, a lot of times you go on the road and the headliner act will try to sabotage the opening acts with just some really petty stuff, like, you know, limiting your stage space or limiting yeah. your access to the, you know, how much, how much light show you can use or not giving you enough time to do a decent <laughs> sound check. Uh, Acid Rain and that, that tour, that was just a, a good time had by all around. I mean, I'm still friends with some of the guys on Facebook. Cool. Um, this, and, yeah. and I think, is this, 
Excuse me, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this photo because I think this is this this pertains to the question. Uh, this is from our good friend, um, guitar player from Kings Never Die and Murphy's Law, uh, Larry the Hunter. Gear que gear question for John. Uh, let's hear the story of his old black flying V, the nuclear assault guitar. Is this the black flying V that he's talking about? That is not. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I believe okay. that's probably walking. Okay. Okay. This is the guitar right here. Okay. Hold it up one more time. There. Oh, that's it. Right. Yep. So we were uh, on a tour in Europe. We flew to, I believe it was Corsica. And when we got to the airport, I grabbed my stuff and the guitar had been thrown around and had a smashed head sock. So I had to sh ship that off to the States to get fixed and order a, a guitar online, unseen, untouched, just, uh, okay, yeah, it looks good. When we order that, uh, it arrived to the hotel just before we had to leave for the venue. So I got on stage with a guitar that I'd never seen before. <laughs> and that actually happened two more times that summer, I think. Oof. That's got to be pretty crushing when you, the plane, the, 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 the guitar comes off the plane and it's like, oh. Well, there's a country music. I actually wrote a song about it. Uh, <laughs> United, United throws guitars. <laughs> and he did a video because he said, yeah, I was on a flight. And the woman next to me like, grabbed me and said, look, 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 the baggage handles are throwing around guitars. And he's looking at oh. his, his instruments getting tossed around the tarmac. Like, oh. Yeah. That's why one thing I like about uh, the airport at Sao Paulo is the baggage handlers are on the other side of a glass wall. You can watch them handle your stuff. And they're aware that you're watching. And, and now, you know, I, I've done some traveling almost pretty of late. Well, other than with, you know, with the band that I'm in where you, where, you know, you carry your, you, you insist on carrying your instrument onto the plane, but like Bobby from Biohazard basically flies with this like coffin, you yeah. know, it's, it, it fits. It, and, and you know what, honestly, I didn't see a case like this back in the day. It's like, I think it's a, a fairly new development. It, it like fits two guitars. There's like wheels on it. And it's like, it's, it, I think it's it, somebody created it specifically for that, you know? Yeah. yeah, because inside the case, your guitars aren't sitting in a foam. That's right. Compartment. They're suspended. Yeah. yeah. To yeah. isolate them from shock. Yep. Yep. Um, well, we did. We touched on this. Do you do martial arts? I did martial arts for about 20 or 30 years. Uh I, I don't really consider myself an active martial artist any longer other than uh, using swords. I still keep up on European swordsmanship. Uh, not your, uh, it, without wanting to get too crazy, there's, most people associate European swordsmanship with Olympic fencing. I do that, but I also do traditional European swordsmanship, which is a lot closer to a, a martial art than Olympic fencing is. Are you do you do you watch the bouts? Do you are you are you into MMA or boxing or stuff? Do you watch any of that stuff? I, yeah, I watch the the highlights. Yeah. Um, I think MMA. I, I I remember when it came out. Yeah, God, yeah, I'm yeah. old. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember one one fight they had. No, actually, it was a, a Mike Tyson fight, and it was pay per view, and they were going to have a, a back card of mixed martial artists. Well, Mike comes out on a pay-per-view event, knocks out his opponent in four seconds. <laughs> and then they were just like, oh, what, do we, what, uh, what, what do we do now? It's like, oh, just get the, the mixed martial arts guys on. But obviously, none of these guys were UFC. They, they, I don't know how much training they had. So they, they had you know, they're pulling each other's hair. It's like, <laughs> like what the hell is this? I remember, yeah, yeah. I remember in 1990. Let's see, I think it was four when I was in LA with Biohazard doing State of the World Address Record at AM. And those guys were like big, you know, that's when MA, remember when yeah. MA first started? It was like the Gracie, the Gracies yeah. with the shit, you know? And we went to like East LA to an underground MMA bout that was in an auto body shop. They set up the, the Octa, an octagon in an auto body shop. There was like, you know, 150 people there. It was, it was, it was down and dirty, man. I think Tank Abbott fought or something. It was oh, gnarly, yeah. man. It was, well, it, was, it was like banned here for a while, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. Like, yes. So I remember being, yeah, you know, right. it, was, it was like around that same 
period drew like early yeah. you know 90s and i was over in holland and a- around that time like i still used to like smoke weed and go to the coffee sure. shops and do all that stuff and i went to this one coffee shop mm-hmm. and i was getting high and they put mma this was like the real primal like no rules at all like bloodbath you know mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and and they put it on and I'd never, I wasn't even aware that this existed, you know, and I'm looking up at this and I'm like, I'm so freaked out. You know what I mean? Because I can't believe that this exists, yeah. I'm like, you know, and you know, you're, you're, you're sitting in a country that has like, you know, like bestiality fetishes, but yeah. like uh, I, this, I was shocked by. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you remember else? back when it started out, there are only two rules, no biting, no eye gouging. Right. Yeah, right. Right. And this was that time. And yeah. the Gracie and the Gracies just beat everybody because they would just get their hands on them and choke them out. <laughs> yeah, and I, I got to meet Horse Gracie once. Mm-hmm. Um, not a big guy at all. Oh yeah, no, not at all, not at all. Um, Darren asks, uh, "Was it your idea, John, to cover the song Ballroom Blitz? And if and if so, why did you choose that song?" I did not choose that song. I would never have chosen that song. I wanted nothing to do with it. And in fact, mm. I think I did have nothing to do with it. <laughs> Glenn sings it. The other guys recorded the rest. I thought it was an idiotic idea. I mean, uh, Overkill had just come out with the same cover really recently. It's like, well, why are we covering a song that Overkill just covered? Yes. Yeah, weird. Yeah. You know, plus, I don't, you know, don't particularly care for the song at all. Makes it, it was also sense. like a, it was a song that feels like it had been covered a million times before that. Yeah, I, I don't know if, who's done it before, but I know Overkill had literally just released it a few months earlier. It's just like yeah. this is stupid. Um, James G. Warrior, Howie, so cool hearing your stories. Big readers, so I need to pick up your books. Please do. Thank you. <laughs> help me help you. Hey, John, what are you listening to these days? And, and I don't think that's necessarily geared towards like, what new music are you listening to? But like, what are you listening? Are you listening to what are you listening to these days? I normally don't listen to anything. Right on. I stopped listening to heavy. Well, we stopped listening to him. Wow. Could that be it? I hope not. Yeah. Gross. At least it's at least it's a semi-flattering still that he's yeah. stuck on. We were doing so good. Oh, there he is. Circles. One more time, John. We lost you. Uh, I have my sound to be in front of the band. Hmm. Hmm. That could be it. Something. Tell me. He started coming back there a little bit. Let's see. Yeah. He's, he's moving. Close. Come on. No, his his uh, his uh, Wi-Fi sort of went out. Is that hey, John. Yeah, you sort of you faded on us. Hey, John, if you can hear me, sign off, sign sign off. So I'm gonna sign, I'm gonna kick you off. Sign back on, okay? Okay. It's weird. We hear him. Yeah, one thing I learned is you kick them off, you bring it back on. It usually, it usually. No, it's that's the way. Like this stuff tends to work because you got. In the meantime, what are you listening to these days, Howie? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Like, there's, there, you know what? I I love a couple of newer albums and bands ish. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, I love Conservative Military Image. Me um, love that that band and that record that they yeah, just put too. out. Um, there's a a band that I wasn't aware of, a straight edge band actually from uh, Florida called Contention, and they just put. Uh, a new song out from an album that's coming out next month and it is fucking murder like it's like if you like bands like uh, Power Trip and Enforced it's Mm -hmm. like right up that alley like very metallic like the riffs are insane but they still do sound sort of like a straight edge hardcore band at the same time other than that I listen to a lot of old music lately like I've been going down like a bit of a classic rock rabbit hole like the other dare, I, dare i ask who well the other day i found myself like for hours listening to elo oh wow like i wound up like just going down that rabbit hole and listening to like multiple elo records i have not gone down that rabbit hole it's a good rabbit hole because like 
the, everything they did, even their singles were like, they all sounded different from the previous one. And, yeah. you know, they're just an interesting band. Like they, they, they also didn't sound like that at the beginning. They had, it took them like six albums for anyone to give a shit. The fact that ask, they got to make six albums. Ask me what I'm listening to. What are we listening to, Drew? Whoever the fuck, whoever the fuck's coming on the show next. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, can you hear us? Oh, he's frozen again. Yeah, I think I think his 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 internet, his internet uh, said out. enough. Yeah, enough yeah. of this nonsense. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> kind of so be it. Um, I guess we should wrap it up. On, yeah, for, on, frozen, frozen John Connolly, right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look. No, it looks like he, he looks like he got up and ran away. He said, we'll, "See ya." We'll, we'll see. We'll see if he. Uh, let me see any anything else. Um, two hardcore bands been rocking Karma and Planet on a Chain. I've heard of Karma. I don't know. Planet Yo, you know who I saw play with Biohazard the other day? Jesus Peace. You ever hear They're of them? Great, great. Wow, really good live too. And you know who told me, like, you got to see him is Danny Schuler's kid, who, who's a great drummer. Colton ah. Schuler was like, yo, I can't believe I just met the drummer for Jesus Peace. And I'm yeah, like. Je Jesus Peace is from Philly. Yeah. They, they fucking brought it, man. Those they guys good. are good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that said. Man, John uh, is trying. Yeah, I know he is. But he's, uh, it looks like his internet. His internet's got, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kick him one more time and see if he can, if he comes back and then we'll wrap, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, Drew, were you at Decibel Fest? I was, yes. I was down there for the first night with Biohazard. Um, and uh, it was, I really enjoyed it. It was a great, it was a great venue. Um, big and a lot of vendors and stuff like it, it was, it reminded me like Milwaukee metal fest, but I really enjoyed it. Sort of a lot. saw a lot of people there and, the, the the venue I know it's a Live Nation room you know but but like the back the, the the dressing room and the backstage and and the people that ran it it was it was very nice I I enjoyed it it was good and I saw Jesus piece I saw crowbar but but my um my crowbar like uh, meter right. runs about yeah. like <laughs> ten minutes bro you know yeah. it's yeah. weird like. I'm not a crowbar guy and I know several people that just worship them, but they never really moved me much. Love Jesus peace, the turnstile. Well, yeah, well, turnstile is turnstile, you know, great yeah. band. Turnstile's already like, you know, on a whole other plane. Last time, last time I, I was, where was I? I was in a record store. I'm, some, I'm like, what is this? The new Jane's addiction. They're like, they were like, turnstile. no, it's turnstile. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah. And I was digging it. I was like, wow, this sounds really good. Is this they a new deserve, game? Yeah. They deserve every drop of success they're having. All right. Paris Mayhew weighing in. Crowbar is excellent. <laughs> and, and what's funny is like uh, it's it, some of those guys are in down, right? Yeah. And I like down, but I don't like yeah. Crowbar as much. It's okay. It's not exactly my cup of tea, but, but you know, it's, it's good. You know, uh, check out the band on the shirt John is wearing. Uh, Crypto, oh, Crypt is awesome. Crypto is Brazilian extreme metal band. Crypt is awesome. Um, I I saw them at uh, at um, Gramercy Theater, mm. and they're excellent. It's all female, like death metal, but they're like there's there's like I don't want to say I guess there is melody to them, but sort of yeah. um, you know they they can sort of play, and they're not like that like total cookie cutter death metal. Like they're interesting. Mm. Yeah. I saw Gitter. I saw Mike Gitter down at, at the Philly thing. Doesn't he I work guess, for Jesus piece? Yeah. And he said he has three bands on the bill that, that, that he's involved in. So, right. Yeah. Hey, I got to give it up for Gitter, man. Still in the game and, and still, you know, still has a, has a passion for it. You know, I mean, him and Monty Connor, are those two like lifers. Have you, you have never had Monty on, have you? He won't come on. Are you serious? Well, he's he's just, he he's not. Monty's like one of these guys. It you know it it takes a while. It makes me jump through a few hoops. I don't really have much to say. Nobody wants to hear from me. Like all that. I'm like, what are you? You know what? That that could be our next little collab. Please. Hey, he's back. Oh, and the Wi-Fi's working. All right, and he's back, ladies and gentlemen. See, we 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 believed. That's why we're still here. <laughs> yeah. 
we 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 had belief. Let me see. Um, okay, good. See you. Show's over. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John. Hey, John. Any memories from when you and Danny were in the audience of Geraldo Rivero's show with the skin? You guys were in the. You guys were in the audience for that. I'm going to take. I'm going to take Kevin's word for it. I, I, I think really that was. He, he might be confusing it with Donahue. Uh, we were. We were at Donahue. Ah, Donahue. Okay. Yeah, I, so don't, a, I don't remember them being at the Geraldo no, thing, but definitely Donahue. Yes. Here's a good here's a good one, John. I mean, or, or I mean, what's John's three favorite thrash albums ever? Listen, I know we're not listening to a lot of that stuff these days, but what what looking back, what was incredibly um resonated with you at the time and that you still have a, a heartfelt love for? Uh, Megadeth's first album. Mm. Uh, Metallica's Ride the Lightning. Yes. Mm. Oh gosh, who do I stick in third place? Uh, you know, not that there's an order in, yeah. in particular, but uh, any Voivod <laughs> albums? Any? Oh man, yeah, this, this is putting me on the spot. Um, Ex what am I thinking? Exodus Slayer albums, Whiplash, oh, Whiplash, Overkill, <laughs> Exodus. Exodus. Ah, yes. Hey, hey, John. This is this is from my notes. A any unsung heroes from that early era? Anyone you thought was just fantastic, who didn't really, you know, break through to the other side? Like, it, it, you know, at the time you thought these guys are just fantastic, and for whatever the reason, they they sort of didn't make it to the promised land. Yeah, we uh, we toured with with, with Exodus over in uh, Europe, mm -hmm. and the opening show was a band called Prospect that nobody here had ever heard of, and every night they'd go on stage. It was kind of more like dream theaterish progressive rock stuff sure. but rick from exodus and i would just stand on the side to the side in the audience watching the lead guitarist do his thing every night and we're both like mm. holy crap this guy's amazing wow yeah but uh they never got anywhere here right well, well what's this thing about the music industry the best musicians out there are not the ones in bands okay yeah. there's for every every phenomenal player that's in a band, there are 50 guys that are better than he is. All right? when, uh, I, when I was touring with 24-7 uh, Spies, uh, Rick is an amazing bass player, you know, hands down. He's, he's one of the best. But then mm -hmm. we went on tour with Primus, with Spies and Primus. And, you know, I'm watching Les Claypool do his thing every night. Um, and then we come back from tour. We're over at the, where the guys lived in the, in the projects in the Bronx. And one of Rick's friends comes on the bus and Rick's like, oh, hey, there's my bass. Want to try it out? And the guy starts playing, and he blew Rick's doors off completely. And this is a guy that nobody's ever heard of and probably yeah. never will. Yeah. Jimmy talked about that when he was on the show with you, Drew. Like, he was talking about, like, these guys, like, that every project had a band. Yeah. And there right. was, like, a healthy competition between yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that yeah. there were these people who were the best musicians to this day that he's ever heard play, <laughs> and they didn't really pursue – careers in music. Well, I think part of it too is, and, and I always sort of use this analogy, you know, you know, there's a lot of great musicians out there, uh, but you know, you also have to be able to play with the other kids in the sandbox. Well, that's right. And, and, and that, that's a big part of it too. It's like, you know, there's a lot of incredibly great musicians that, that kind of don't get out of the rehearsal room because um, they're socially challenged and don't have the ability to, you know, to, to play with the other kids in the sandbox. Right, but you and, also and then, you also got to factor in if you're on stage, you're not there to just play your instrument, play the song. You're there to put a show on. Yeah, and right. I, it irritates the crap out of me if I'm at a concert. It's four guys on stage all staring at the neck of the guitar. It's like, you know, guys, come on. What if they're wearing and, sweatpants? Sorry. What if they're wearing sweatpants also? I don't care how they're dressed. I just, you know, move around, put a show on. It's, to and, to, to me, like when death metal got to the, that thing, like where yeah. the band just wore sweatpants, like they, they basically like rolled out of their bunks on in, in the bus and like got on stage. And I was like, I know you're not, I don't care that much about image, but I still feel like that's just like giving up. <laughs> well, I, I, I did catch a lot of flack on a European tour because uh, I wore sandals the whole <laughs> Or there's the other, the camo shorts. There's the, the camo, camo shorts. shorts. Well, that's, you know, that's well, like the standard, shorts. standard operating procedure. You know, Paris Mayhew uh, from Agro is formerly Cro-Mags. Paris, 
it says it, songs are king. You right. Know? Facts. Yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter what kind of music it is. It doesn't matter. Sure. But like, you know, even if it's like, you know, those, those quickie, like 15 second hardcore songs back yeah. in the day that people would do, it's like, if the vocal is memorable, then it, there's a hook, Yeah, you know, and, and that matters. Fantastic. Hey, uh, that said, as, uh, as we near, uh, it, it's dinner time here on the East coast. And, uh, I, I got how many times you've said that said tonight. <laughs> and, and I got to eat dinner and I got, I'm going to go see Doyle tonight. And yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. John, Thank you so much for coming on the show. It was it was really great. Anybody you want to thank or shout out or push or anything? Well, I'll see you guys. Thank you. Uh, if I can do a shameless plug for a friend. Please. Sure. Please. If you like death metal, check out a band called Crypta from Brazil. Yeah, we just talked about them. Yeah. While I you put, actually, put. while you were MIA for a minute, someone brought up Crypta and we talked about them. They're awesome. But they also put on an awesome live show, right? Even if you don't care for the music or the vocals, the, the show itself is, is yeah. excellent. Paulie, Paulie says, yes, I saw Crypto last year in Tampa, and they friggin' rocked. And then and then Count Ralph has said, check out the band on the shirt John is wearing, right. Crypto female-fronted Brazilian extreme metal band. Right. Well, Fernando is the singer-bass player. Uh, we've met a, a few times over the years, and then we recently connected on Facebook. Um, and she was formerly the singer bassist for Nervosa, but I don't know what happened there. Don't want to know. It's none of my business. <laughs> but uh, she turned around and had this new band up and running in like 10 minutes. Wow. I'm, I'm actually kind of, you know, I, I'm seriously impressed that she was able to do, do that fast of a turnaround. Yeah, they're good. They're actually, you know who turned me on to them, Drew? Ill Bill. Ah. Like about Ill, a year ago. Ill He's Bill like, was... Ill Bill with his incredible, extensive knowledge of extreme Dude, metal. Dude, he, he, his ear for metal is incredible because he yeah. told me about them well over a year ago before they put out this last album that they did. And, like, they've toured now America a couple of times, I think, right. and all this stuff. And, like, I was like, these guys are – these guys, these girls are really, really good. And now, like, people, like, know about them. It was it was kind of crazy. And, like, cool. I didn't even – because I can't see your shirt, John. Like, someone else saw it, you know, um, and saw that it was a crypto shirt. Yeah, they're good. I like them. What do you, th what do you think about the Stitched Up Heart? I don't know that band. Okay. I think they're more West Coast right now. Um, but, again, you know, the, the singer and I connected on Facebook. Uh, she's got a great sense of humor, cares about animals. Uh, Lacuna Coil, Christina Scabby, and I, yeah, 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 you know, correspond on Facebook, sure. and it's funny because I'll get these messages from, oh, I'm the handler for this band. Uh, you've been chosen as a fan. It's like, well, I don't really follow them because of their music. I follow them because I like their sense of humor. Yeah. You now, in fact, if you put a gun to my head and said, "Hum a, a Lacuna Coil song," I'd tell you. Yeah, no her. idea. No <laughs> idea. Yeah, but she's got a wonderful sense of humor. She cares about you know, cares about some of the same issues. Is I that do. Doyle's girlfriend, Howie? No, she's in another band. Um, the, 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 this Doyle's girl's girlfriend a is the girl from the Coda Coils, Italy. Uh, yes, I think that's it. That's uh, is that Alyssa Guzman? Yes, I think so. She's that she's is she married to Doyle? Or girlfriend. I don't, I don't. I don't think they're married, but they're certainly they've been yeah, in. Doyle from the uh, here, yeah. Arch couple. enemy. Yeah. 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 If you like that stuff, check out Infected Ring. Okay. Good to know. All good right. Know. Hey, John. Thank you, man. Let's keep in yeah. touch. Gentlemen, thank you so much. That thank was a pleasure. You. All right. Good All seeing right. you again. Hi. Hey. All right. You too. Well, that was great. Yeah, that was fun, man. Three good hours. Enjoy. You know, what the, mission, you know what the mission is? You know what the, our mission is now, right? Which is what? Hold on. Someone, somebody posted it. Here you go. Wait, where is it? Jimmy Hazel says, get Monty on the show, Drew. <laughs> I think we could do it. Will you reach out to him? Because every time 100%. I try to tell him, he's, he's like, eh, I don't know. Nobody wants I'm like, what are you talking about? I got, I got him when we were doing Merciless. 
I once got, uh, Bill was going on tour and I was like, I don't really want to do the show by myself. I can't see myself doing that. Right. Um, and I got Monty to co-host with me and it was great. But but was it a podcast or was it a video show like this? No, no video. It's a it's a radio he show. He was saying, "I have an old computer. It doesn't have." Oh, he should. Tell, I'm going to tell him to shut the fuck up. He could use his phone for all I care. <laughs> all right, that's that's our mission. Um, right. Once again, what a great show. Uh, do you, do you want to uh, thank anybody? Give anything a push again? Mention what's coming up. Yeah, the only thing that I'll say is you know that was fun. And I love, you know, doing the show and doing it with John was great. You know, I've known him for, I realized, just short of 40 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, tomorrow uh, on my socials, I will be putting up links to the pre-order for Vinny Stigma's book, The Most Interesting Man in the World. Fantastic. And so that, so that train's about to get rolling. That's great, man. Good. All right, Howie. I'll see you. I'll see you. I'll see you. Up I'll the see block. you like when you're on your way to the post office or whatever. All right. Take care. Have a good night. See you, bro. All right. Well, there you have it. Another one in the bag. Yeah. Thank you, Paris. It, it was great. No sports or Iron Maiden. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Billy. Yeah, it was a great show. I'm glad you learned something. We all learned something. It's a learning experience. The New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Um, uh, next up, like I said, I'll be up in I'll be up in Boston. Ray Capo event a week from today down at the Bowery Electric, and then a week from Wednesday is the new music show. Thanks a lot, everybody. I truly appreciate it. Tell your loved ones that you love them. It is very important. Until next time, do good things and good things. <laughs>